Bite the pillow, we're going in dry. It's the game that takes you to Pound Town. It's Gears of Halo Theft Auto 7. It's what? Gears of Halo Theft Auto 7. By the taint of Tina Taylor, it's back. That's right, Jimmy. The open world game that sunk Australia is back. And this time, we're taking all the knee-slapping fun of war crimes and taking it global. My bowels are tingling with excitement. That's no coincidence, Jimmy. Any contact with Gears of Halo Theft Auto will instantly purge you of all bodily fluids. All the fun of the Taco Bell dollar menu in a game! <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Rollin' 20. We are the show that allowed Colossus to use our bathroom not too long ago. Let's just say what he left was definitely unflushable. I am Jeremy. Steve. And Jesse. Remember, you can subscribe to this show and several others in the MSP library at MissionStarPodcast.com. You can like us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, and Tumblr. Follow us on Twitter at the Rolling 20s. You can send us any fan mail, suggestions for the show, or hate mail at MSPFreight at Yahoo.com. The music you heard before the show is by Machina Supremacy. You can find more of their discography for free download at MachinaSupremacy.com, as well as their latest couple of albums on Amazon.com. The clip you heard was Gears of Halo Theft Auto F- 7 by Mike Manor. You can find more of his videos under YouTube.com under his channel of Mike Manor. How's it going so far? Uh, it's uh, been a week. <laughs> I'm Expand. I don't know what that means. It's been one week. I, I, other than that, not too much has gone on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I am getting tired of seeing Pokemon Go on my Facebook feed. I'm just sick and tired of it. I'm still playing the damn game. I'm sick and tired of this, listening to people gripe and moan about it. <laughs> it's amazing. They change a couple features and everyone's like, oh, that's it. I quit. It's like, uh, fine. Thank you. <laughs> other than that, other than that, I saw Suicide Squad. No? Yeah. Did it come down to your expectations? I... Yeah. <laughs> it was a better viewing than Batman vs. Superman, but that's not hard to do. Yeah, you know, usually, to, to be a better movie than Batman v. Superman, all you need is five people sitting around a table and breathing for two hours. They had six. That would have made a better movie. <laughs> I just, so, I, I love the fact, I told him, well, that isn't really saying much, and he's like, well, let's, let, let, let's put it this way then. You know, I, I was able to pay attention to the entire movie, and I said, you were able to pay attention. That's still not saying much. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't I, tune out watching it. It's all I'm saying. I didn't tune out. <laughs> Great. Maybe that means I'll leave the theater not knowing how many ceiling tiles there are. I uh, no, I, I I played it safe this week. I meant to go to the theaters and watch Star Trek Beyond, but I just uh, I just decided to keep it busy working, do a little bit of cleaning and a little bit of rearranging in my space. And, uh, you know, I found out that uh, my wife has a pretty solid job prospect upcoming where oh, so cool. the company she's been volunteering for has two open positions. So she applied and found out she's the only one that applied for either one of them. So it's like, wow. <laughs> so fish in a barrel, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that may change my Comic-Con prospects rather greatly. But that's a story for another time, and one I'm sure most people don't give a crap about. Uh, the subject of this week is Suicide Squad. Uh, we took issues from the Alice Coat Run. Uh, it's issues 20 through 23 of a recent volume. We'll, we'll get into that after we get through the news of the week. And uh, first off, we have Marvel Media News. We talk about Marvel properties that end up on TV screens, tablet screens, phone screens, uh, audio recordings, books on tape. Uh, billboards, skywriting, and occasionally even the the, uh, writing on the bathroom wall. But, uh, you know, a lot of people have been freaking out about Mark Ruffalo's Instagram lately because he's posted a couple photos of what he says is Chris Hemsworth in full Thor 3 costume. Oh? Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, some people have been freaking out about this, and I decided to take a look for myself, you know, just being the enterprising person that I am. Is he trolling uh, people? Huh? Is he trolling people? I have the distinct impression 
that he may be serious at the man's in costume, but he may not be in full costume. Let me <laughs> let me show you what I saw. And this is the image everyone has been losing their crap over. There you go. Take a look at that. Because you can clearly see Crims Hemsworth standing in front of what looks like a gigantic shirt with short hair and a beard while playing on a phone. He does not look like he's dressed for a movie. No. And the reason why a lot of people have been freaking out over this particular picture is that the recent uh, announcement of... Who's a fudge? Thor... The unworthy Thor, if you recall. Thor Odinson. It looks like he's going to gain uh, Ultimate Thor's hammer. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you recall what he's going to look like in that series, but he's going to look like this. If you take a look at this, uh, the hair and the beard are very similar to what Crims Hemsworth is rocking in that picture. However, I will remind people that I did go to, to Hall H this year. I saw the CG footage that's been prepared so far for Thor Ragnarok. It involved a long-haired Thor. And something else I would like to remind people is I seriously doubt that Chris Hemsworth isn't wearing his own hair for the four movies he's been in the, so far. <laughs> I'm certain he's been wearing a very long wig. Mm. So I think people need to slow down. And I don't think Ruffalo is trolling people. I think he's just having fun on the set, not realizing the kind of firestorm he's, pull, he's putting together with the fanboys, you know? <laughs> or maybe he does. And make, that makes him a troll. I, I don't think so. That just, that's never been Ruffalo's style. He does goofy stuff, but he doesn't do stuff just to make people mad later. Uh, somebody else from the set of Thor Ragnarok, Tessa Thompson, she's been posting things in her own right. And uh, what she's been posting, I'm pretty certain, is a bit more of a movie item. Because she posted on her Instagram about a week ago, quote, Day 18 update. I have a lot of bruises and suddenly abs from laughing so much. And I never want to not have a sword again, unquote. <laughs> she posted a picture of a director-style chair that she's been sitting in with the name Valkyrie on it. And apparently the sword she's been using for the filming. And I... <laughs> I don't recall Valkyrie Sword in the comic books looking anything like that, but again, it's a movie. Things are going to change. You know, Almost after looks all, like a practice sword. Well, things have got to change because, after all, this is a black Valkyrie, which has never been in the comics. Hmm. I don't see how that's got to change anything. Well, it doesn't change a whole lot, but it just means that things are changed between the comics and the movies. It's a granted. It's a given. It's happening. You know, Brunhilde was never a black woman in the comic books even though several Marvel heroes have changed to black women in the comic books recently. But uh, speaking of which, the director of Black Panther seems to have an idea as to what he wants to do with the movie. Uh, we know that Ryan Coogler is going to be the director. We know that he was at uh, Comic-Con, and he said they haven't even started filming yet. But he had something interesting to say to io9, because they asked him about what his vision was for the fictional world of Wakanda. You know, the country the Black Panther comes from and rules with an iron fist. Uh, he said, quote, That's a hard question to answer, man, because we're still trying to figure that out. What I will say is, obviously, Wakanda has to be impressive and it has to be unique. And that's one of the things we're looking at right now. That's one of the things we're working with my production designer, Hannah Beachler, to try to find. Trying to find out what Wakanda is, what Wakanda looks like, and how that relates to the relationship with the other technolo technologically advanced cities we've seen before in film. We've seen a lot of those recently, so that's one of the biggest challenges right there, unquote. This guy probably create the same grandeur as Asgard with his own identity. Well, Asgard, though, is more Citadel-like than Wakanda. Wakanda, at least as far as the comic book's presentations lately, is a very wide, plain-style country in Africa that is dotted with major cities and then again dotted with other... Uh, you know, more tribal and traditional African villages. So it's going to be a hard dichotomy to put up in one movie. Mm -hmm. In comic books, it's easy. You just draw it here, you draw it there, and then you're done. In movies, you got to make that not just look distinct, but you got to make it look realistic. Which yeah. is something comic books generally doesn't have to worry about. You know, I'm not saying so realistic is it, unless you can show me the sewer line, I don't believe it. Nothing that wild. But still, you've got to be able to suspend disbelief for a lot of people. And a much more general uh, people, too. Uh, ABC is hinting that they may be looking to expand their Marvel footprint since it recently contracted. 
if you recall, they passed on the new Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. spinoff, Marvel Most Wanted. Mm-hmm. And then not long after that, they announced the cancellation of Agent Carter. Uh, according to ABC Network President Channing Dunney, just because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the only show they have left doesn't mean they're done. He said, quote, We all came to an agreement that the next show we want to do together is something that is as creatively strong as it can be. Uh, unquote. And as for what the next Marvel show would be or whether it could follow Netflix's model of interconnected narrative, Dungey said, quote, That's an interesting question, and we have talked a little bit about that, yes, unquote. Uh, ABC says that it does have several Marvel projects in the pipeline, including a long-in-development series uh, based on the Damage Control comic book, a second untitled comedy, and a project from producer John Ridley, which Ridley himself says is going to reinvent a Marvel character. Hmm. Interesting. Sla- slapstick the show? Oh, God. No. <laughs> <laughs> All I want I don't is think a the- cup of coffee. I don't think they have the budget to do that. Dark Hawk and the Wheeled Warriors? Never mind. Boo! <laughs> uh, well, there is an Avengers cartoon going on right now. I believe it's called uh, Avengers Ultron Revolution. Uh, and uh, Avengers Assemble Ultron Revolution is a subtitle for it. Yeah. Uh, actually, no. The Sunday episode is called Avengers Ultron Revolution. Apparently, it's, it used to be Assemble up until the latest season. Yeah, that's uh, what they did with Spider-Man. A clip has been released online because two new characters are being introduced this episode, one of which is going to become a returning character in the next season. Uh, in this episode, Inferno, a very young and human who has pyrokinetic abilities, and Kamala Khan have to team up with Captain America to deal with a threat. Huh. You want to see the clip they released so far? Sure. Right. It would be interesting to put a video. voice to some of these characters. I, you'd be surprised because it starts off with a very familiar word, but I sent the video. Ambiguous. And there it is. <laughs> There's no question by use of that word who it is. Yeah. The ghost. Long time Tony Stark enemy and it used to be a thunderbolt on a couple different teams. Oh. You didn't need that, did you? He has density control abilities, and he's very anti-corporate. I already took out Falcon and Hawkeye. A couple of weak Think of him as an evil libertarian. Easy picking. Inferno, slow him down. Yeah, yeah fire bad. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, your molecules still burn. Or anywhere else for that matter. <laughs> Pretty sure I heard this, this voice actress before somewhere. Well, it tends to be the same group of voice actors. After, even after one gets established, they tend to get a dozen jobs pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. So that comes out every Sunday right now. Uh, the uh, the Deadpool sequel is supposed to play around more with superhero movies. The producer of the film, Simon Kinsberg, he told, recently told Slash Film, quote, I think Deadpool 2 will comment on anything that's happening in movies today, especially in superhero movies. The sort of glut or saturation of these movies and the proliferation of sequels is definitely something we'll play around with, unquote. Hmm. Well, he'll have a lot of material to deal with by the, team he's, by the time he's done with this film. Oh, oh yeah. Yes, he will. And, of course, everybody knows by now that the plan for the second movie has been to introduce a screen version of Cable, which will be a first. And somebody asked him about the casting for that, and he said, quote, I've seen rumors about everybody from Arnold Schwarzenegger to I can't even remember. We haven't cast him <laughs> is the truth, unquote. So there is no actor to play Cable as of yet. Who would you ask to play Cable? Not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Although he might be old enough for the role. Actually, I think he's too old for the role. I think he's in his 60s now. I don't know, somebody, I can't remember who recommended the uh, the guy from uh, Avatar, not The Last Airbender, but... The, well, yeah, the, he movie. recommended him. He recommended himself. Yeah, that's right. He's the and one I, who put his name out there. I, I actually like that idea, so... I, I still think Kurt Russell would make a great cable. Yeah, but he's already ego now. Oh, oh like people can't do multiple things. The guy that was Chuck is Fandral now. Yeah, I know, I'm just... <laughs> I'd rather see somebody else do it, but yeah, Kurt Russell wouldn't be bad either. Yeah, 
Goodness knows, we've had human torches get reassigned all over the place. <laughs> uh, it was officially announced at uh, Comic-Con, but uh, the presser was put out this week that Daredevil Season 3 has been greenlit. There's no other information to go with it, probably because the story won't be talked about until after The Defenders is out, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. You know, goodness knows they don't want to spoil what's going to happen in that miniseries. When it comes to Marvel's TV, it's kind of interesting because we know that uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in its next season is going to have a new director. It's not going to be uh, Phil Coulson anymore. Word has come down that Batman is the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Who? Batman. An actor who's played animated which, which Batman, J- oh, Jason okay. O'Mara, has been cast as the unnamed director. Ah. Uh, the reason for this, as has been explained in a couple of pressers, is that after the Sokovia Accords in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, S.H.I.E.L.D. has been picked by the president to handle the uh, registration and regulation of superhumans, so they've been brought out of the shadows. Because Phil Coulson is still publicly a dead entity, he cannot be director of S.H.I.E.L.D. for that time. Oh. So they brought in somebody else to run the company. They brought someone that's te- uh, legally breathing. Yes. So that's why uh, Coulson is now an agent with Mac as his partner. Uh, the Captain America statue we saw at Comic-Con, the big 13-foot bronze one, mm-hmm. it was unveiled in Brooklyn, New York. However, it's already having something written into it. It's oh. not graffiti. It's not graffiti. There was a petition that was started about four weeks ago, and according to a post on the petition page, Marvel has agreed to what is in the petition. Have you followed what? this story at all? I have not. No, first I've heard of it. Okay. Marvel has agreed to add two names to the statue that have previously been missing. Their names are Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Oh, nice. oh okay. okay. That's right. When they made this statue, they forgot to put the creators of Captain America's names on the stupid thing. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after no, that, they already be cast it. Easily fixed, so... Yeah, but that means as soon after you put this thing out there, you got to send somebody out with some metal cutting and uh, chiseling tools and just go, crap, I thought I finished this thing already. Now, it, it, it's amazing sometimes how people just forget the guys that actually created the stuff they read. Mm. Or in the case of Marvel and Disney, the guys that created the stuff that's made them millions of dollars. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oversight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something that fanboys will never let go of. And last up in Marvel media news, Brie Larson. She was announced as Carol Danvers, a.k.a. Captain Marvel, during the uh, Hall H panel at Comic-Con. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, She has been on Instagram recently announcing that she has been hard at work studying for the role of Captain Marvel. You will not believe. Uh, Not really. Take a look at this. This is her laying on a couch in a Captain Marvel t-shirt reading one graphic novel. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that's uh, now you want to mention trolling that's trolling <laughs> <laughs> you know but at least she's getting into it and I, I did some reading on her recently just because I had the time she was indeed Envy Adams in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World but she's also an Oscar winner she won an Oscar last year for the movie The Room right right so geez Marvel Disney is just adding to the list of Oscar winners they've got working on Marvel properties lately. She must be married, because I noticed a ring on her, uh, on her left hand. But I don't know much about her relationship status. Uh, do you guys remember anything you've seen her in? Because all I can remember is Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and 21 Jump Street. Mm. I very rarely remember who played what. <laughs> Okay, but we're never going to forget Bruce Willis in The Vice. Oh, God. Oh, God. Why, why <laughs> you remind you keep us of that? bringing it up? Because <laughs> <laughs> it gets reactions like that. Troll. Well, you can be ugly, too. Oh, wait, she was in all that? Yes, she was actually pretty prolific. Huh. We'll move into DC Media News. We'll talk about the other major property and their multimedia uh, projects that are upcoming. Uh, Suicide Squad raked in $20.5 million on its Thursday preview night. It's actually got a pretty good haul, despite the fact that uh, 
Critics are treating it worse than Joe treated Michael, really. <laughs> uh, but it does have a major problem upcoming, and that is that China appears to be poised to deny allowing the movie to be released in its own country. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, Variety is reporting that the film's level of violence and dark tone are making it increasingly unlikely that Warner Brothers will be allowed to bring the movie to China which will definitely hurt its overall box office, since China is currently the number two market for movies internationally. I've seen one other one. movies with more violence than this one. As for Dark Tones, no. Well, well it, it's, it's, you have seen movies with more violence. Whether or not they've allowed movies with more violence in China is the question. Uh, yeah, th- this is the country that said no to Deadpool. This is the country that said no to Deadpool. And Transformers was animated violence. Uh, Let me see. This is actually pretty problematic when it comes to this type of issue because uh, some independent economists have stated that unless the Suicide Squad pulls down a total of $750 million internationally, it won't be considered a a hit. Hmm. Who who is the number one, by the way? The number one what? Uh, International... Oh, the U.S. still spends the most money when it comes to movie tickets. Okay. I, I'm thinking, other than the United States, who the hell beats out China? That's why I was concerned that it was number two, because I was eliminating the United States from that, since that's where we're from and wouldn't really be international. Yeah, but if it was international but the United States, that would mean that Galactus lifted the United States off the map and flung it into space. Yeah, I, I, I suppose. <laughs> so I wasn't quite sure where you were leading with that question. No, I just, I was like, I was I was excluding the United States for whatever reason, but I was just like, okay, if China's number two, who the hell is number one? Uh, Jesse. Yeah? What kind of role did Killer Croc have in the film? Very minor. I... See, I wonder if that has to do with rewrites. It came out this week that Killer Croc was not the first pick for the monster role in the Suicide Squad film. They went with a more traditionally recent character for the script, but they decided that King Shark would be too much CG in the film and decided to replace him with Killer Croc. Mm. If if King Shark was it, the uh, Killer Croc was a nice substitute because they didn't have to really change much for his moment in the movie. The thing is, though, when it comes to my personal preference, I don't know why exactly they changed it because other than the fact that they scaled down Killer Croc for this film. To me, Killer Croc and King Shark would need about the same amount of CG either way. They would both be, mm-hmm. like, hulking 10-foot monsters. Yeah, well, Killer Croc no. still has a human-like face to him, so... They could get uh, into depend- aesthetics. Again, depends on which version you're talking about, and either way, it should have been a ton of CG. It should not have been a 6-foot man in a rubber suit, in my opinion. You know, the, the problem foot? with going this... Um, approximately. He wasn't that much taller than the rest of the actors in just about every picture I've seen. Definitely Mm -hmm. wasn't Seven. And the director of the Suicide Squad, uh, David Ayers, has had to issue an apology. About? Well, on Monday night, this past Monday, was the red carpet premiere in New York of the film. And while he was out there... Somebody in the crowd, after he was done introducing a film, decided to yell, fuck Marvel, at the top of their lungs, to which he looked at him, and he basically uh, parroted them and said, yeah, fuck Marvel. Oh. It probably wouldn't have been so bad, except, of course, somebody was uh, videotaping with a phone during the premiere and caught him and put it online. (laughs) So he issued an apology uh, a couple days later about it. Uh, You know... He said in a tweet, quote, Sorry about getting caught up in the moment and saying fuck Marvel. Someone said it, I echoed, not cool. Respect for my brother filmmakers, unquote. Ah. Not trying to kick a man when he's down because he's having a rough time with this film, at least critically. It seems like monetarily it's off to a decent start, but we saw that Batman v Superman was off to a Titanic start and then had a... Titanic you know, moment. Al- yeah, almost appropriately Titanic fall. So, you know, sank after it hit that iceberg. Um, it it seems like so far, if it follows the same pattern, Suicide Squad is going to follow it. You know, I, whether or not it's as fast, I don't know, but... 
Given it didn't make as much as Batman v Superman in its opening weekend, it seems it's going to fall about twenty six million short of that. And the fact that this isn't like marquee, the same kind of marquee properties that Warner Brothers had for Batman v Superman, uh, I'm going to guess this movie makes somewhere between six hundred fifty and seven hundred million. As it stands, if they lose China, that may bump down about another thirty forty million. I'd say. Mm-hmm. So the. the <laughs> You know, two things where you're ending up beneath your uh, your goals as far as your cinematic universe is definitely not an auspicious start. Well, techn- I guess actually it'd be three since Man of Steel officially kicked off their cinematic universe. This is rough, man. Yeah. I mean, we we got a couple minutes here brainstorming. What do you think is missing from DC's properties? What is the problem here? Uh yeah. They're not breaking the mold enough. But I what? can't really say that. I mean, I think they're doing that inappropriately. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I, I think they're shooting for too much too fast. Well, yeah, that's been one of my constant complaints. You know, they, they need to slim down these cast movies and stop with the ensembles and actually take a character and focus on it for a while. Yeah. Which may be why Wonder Woman so far has been like the best trailer I've seen from their cinematic universe. They, they've, they've got Wonder Woman and a few of her known supporting players in the film, and they haven't tried to shoehorn in any extra Bruce Wayne scenes, as far as I know, in the yeah. movie. Well, it would be a little difficult, since I don't think he would have been born at that point. No, but uh, some. now that I've said that, I almost had this image of, this mov- of the movie starting with Diana Prince sitting in the Batcave and him asking her, So where did you come from anyway? I don't know. Well, so to do that. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. Be- and Ben Affleck gets to make another million for showing up for 15 minutes of work. <laughs> you know, not saying he's not worth it, but just because Warner Brothers would pay that much just to make sure he doesn't go do anything else. Uh, the Flash season three is upcoming, I believe, this fall. And as we know, Barry has started the Flashpoint. Grant Gustin told Newsarama, quote, Barry starts to forget things about his old life as time goes by, unquote. Ooh. So apparently, at, the longer he spends in the Flashpoint universe, the more things start to realign. Um, I would guess that he's created a universe that after he arrives, he finds out that he has no Flash powers. With both of his parents alive, why would he ever become a CSI? Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, he'd probably become more of a standardized scientist. Uh, I, I just don't know if he wouldn't have his powers, period, or if they would s- just start disappearing over time in the universe. And Supergirl has hired a new actress. Katie McGrath has been hired to be in a recurring role in the new season of Supergirl on the CW. She was a Jurassic World actress. I've been staring at her picture, and I believe she played the assistant that was picked up by a pteranodon and fed to a megalish... Uh, alligator towards the end of the film. Okay. Uh, she's been hired to play Lena Luthor. Luthor? Yeah, yeah Lex Luthor's sister. <sighs> okay. <laughs> What's that sound about? The character's comic established. She exists. Yeah. I know, I know. You know, shoot, she was created in 1961. As a Lois Lane supporting character of all things. Really? Huh. Yeah, in 1961, Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane, number 23. Uh, she even reappeared in CBS's Superboy and the CW Smallville as characters. So it's not like they just created something for Supergirl to wrestle against that isn't Lex Luthor. Although it's. You know, it, it's, it's one of those things where the CW shows. They're working as well as they can within the constraints Warner Brothers gives them. They really do need to al- Warner Brothers needs to allow its own network in the form of the CW to actually use all the characters in the arsenal. It's a little bizarre to watch the Flash and the Arrow have to deal with the same C and D listers every week. Yeah. You know, I mean, shoot, if Sinestro showed up in the Flash, I would mark out. <laughs> that would be awesome as hell. And last up in DC Media News, uh, we just talked about a Supergirl, uh, an actress has been added to Supergirl, but there's one that's been reduced now. 
And this follows up a previous notion that we heard that Callista Flockhart is reducing her role in season two of Supergirl because the production company, or once the series was bought by the CW, the production was moved to Vancouver from Los Angeles. Callista Flockhart lives in Los Angeles and she really doesn't feel like living in Canada for six months out of the year. Yeah. Well, don't blame her. I, I can't say I do either. I mean, she's up in years, and she has to take care of her husband, who had his leg crushed by Millennium Falcon, so she's got her hands full. Yeah. And I don't imagine that cold air would agree with that injury. No. No, nor with all the likely plastic surgery the two of them have had over the years. <laughs> Hey, look, I'm sorry. Callista Flockhart, decent actress, but her face doesn't look like it's moved since the end of Allie McBeal. All right, now we have general media news. We'll talk about the nerdy multimedia properties that aren't Marvel and DC related. Got to start with something sad and a little personal to my heart and my religion. David Huddleston passed away this week. He was 85 years old. Uh, David Huddleston has been a mainstay in movies for an extremely long time. Uh, his first breakthrough role was in 1972 in a Civil War film called Bad Company. Uh, he appeared opposite John Wayne in Rio Lobo. He was with Jimmy Stewart in Fool's Paradise. He was opposite Bette Davis in uh, Family Reunion. He played the title role in Santa Claus in 1985. He once said that the most fun he ever had on a set was on the, the uh, while filming Blazing Saddles. <laughs> he was one of the Johnsons of Rock Ridge. And... Uh, the reason why I said this hurts me personally and religiously, David Huddleston was the actor who played uh, Jeffrey Lebowski, the large corporate Jeffrey Lebowski in The Big Lebowski. He was the one who was trying to embezzle his company during the film. Gotcha. He was 85 years old at the time of his death. He died due to heart and kidney disease in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Man, that, that's a guy who had a very long life. Well, it was a very big career. He was even in the Air Force for four years. He used the GI Bill to attend the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. Hmm. And he graduated back in 1957. That's just amazing. Uh, as proof that anybody can get into the superhero business these days, 50 Cent is, has begun developing a new superhero-themed drama with Stars Network entitled Tomorrow Today. Okay, um, first of all, the series he's creating sounds like a newspaper drama, but it's not. It is a superhero-themed drama about a veteran who's wrongfully imprisoned for a crime he didn't commit, and while in prison, he becomes the subject of an experiment designed to create the perfect man before breaking out and using his powers for good. Several people in the superhero and comic book community have noted that 50 Cent's new project sounds an awful lot like the origin to Luke Cage. Yeah. Uh, as far as what 50 Cent said, he said, quote, I'm looking forward to continuing my relationship with the Stars family. We've had a great success together on Power, and I'm excited to get going on all of our upcoming projects together. I knew Stars would be the perfect home for tomorrow today. This project is very personal to me, creating it, writing it, finding the best team for it, and I will continue to be involved every step of the way, unquote. I would really like to hear a story about them in the middle of filming and Mike Coulter and like five guys from his production crew just burst onto the set and ask, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> um, as, if the, uh, as if the connections could get more serious... He's working on this project with uh, Boys in the Hood director John Singleton, who tried to work with 50 Cent before on a Luke Cage movie all the way back in 2004. He described the original Luke Cage project as, quote, imagine if 50 Cent got superpowers, unquote. I'm sensing, <laughs> I'm sensing a problem here. Yeah. Because if anything, the original Luke Cage was what if Shaft got superpowers? You know what I mean? 50 cent. Oh, I sense trouble. Uh, ABC. ABC's not resting on its laurels. It, it's working with different Marvel properties to try and create TV series right now. It has Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It wants to create another live-action series, but it wants to create a Star Wars series. That'll be interesting. 
According to Channing Dungey, ABC Entertainment President, he said, quote, As a fan, I would absolutely love to say yes. We've had conversations, and we will continue to have conversations with Lucasfilm. It would be wonderful to extend the franchise, unquote. Would Star Wars make a good TV show? You know, I do remember them doing a, a kind of a Jim Henson special back in the day. It, if you mean that you Christmas know. thing, that's not allowed to hit airwaves like ever again. Is it not? <laughs> No, George Lucas would, like, walk out and kill whoever aired it, man. He has demanded that all the tapes be destroyed. The fact that there's bootlegs well, out there is still I amazing. never saw it again. Yeah. Yeah, he um, hated that after it was done. Really? I, well, I don't know. I was a kid. I can't, I can't like, since I haven't seen it again, I can't really... I, I have not seen it, even though I'm sure if I looked a little bit around the internet, I could find it. I stopped when I read the description about Han Solo visiting Chewbacca at his home and visiting Chewbacca's family. His wife was named Itchy, of all things. Oh, okay. No, this is not what I'm thinking of then. Okay. If you mean that Ewoks TV show, that wasn't technically a success either. That ended after no, a season. No, because I think that was built off of the, uh, the movies that came out. Well, the movies were spinoffs of Return of the Jedi, and uh, right. they... They were one-shots that fed hungry Star Wars fans that, at the time, I don't remember which network it was, I think it was ABC, just said, wow, there's a market for this, let's make a show, to which most people just said, you know, we only watch these things so much because they were only put out like once every three years. The fact that you gave us a show doesn't help. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I not... think they could do it a, a, a decent enough. I don't think it will work because Star Wars has this, uh, this uh, weird ideolo mythos and ideology that I don't think they can... Do extend for a full-on TV series. I, if I they do, they, it might piss off a lot of people. I think they, it's possible, personally, but they would have to stay away from a lot of uh, heavy mentions of what's become known as the main characters of any sort. they got to start telling stories that's away from the Skywalker and Solo families, in my opinion. I don't know. I mean, it... it they, they've done Battlestar Galactica, and that was a huge success. If they do something kind of like that, you know, in the yeah, Star Wars universe, but, you know... Well, Galactica yeah. was not a network TV show, though. That was a cable TV show. Yeah, and that's true. You have much bigger allowances, but smaller budgets. You know, Galactica got away with what it did. I mean, it was well-written, but it was very edgy, uh, even compared to today's TV. Uh, Star Wars is more of a family-friendly property. I, I think you've got to tell rich stories, not so much shocking stories when it comes to a Star Wars TV show. Yeah, God knows we don't want another Firefly. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. Fox certainly doesn't. <laughs> and at this, point, I, at this point, I don't think even Joss Whedon wants another Firefly. Well, no, he doesn't, but that's you know because he got pissed <laughs> about several things. No, not because he's pissed, because he and a couple of the actors have said that they hope to never work on that show again, simply because the hype has been built up so high around the show, he doesn't feel that anything he does can ever live up to the hype. Mm, he thinks he can yeah. do better than the show, but he doesn't think he can ever overcome the hype that now surrounds it. That's, that's a great concern, yes. <laughs> he is keeping it real. Yep. Uh, one show that has been canceled is uh, Brian Michael Bendis' Powers TV show. It was on the PlayStation Network. It was announced this week that season two will, was the last season of the show, at least for the time being. Uh, I, I watched the first season. I have not gotten into the second season yet. It had a very good beginning, but I can see why people would not gravitate to the show. Uh, it was a show about a fictional superpower beings police bureau that was supposed to, obviously take care of issues involving superpower beings who were as prevalent as regular people at this point. Mm. You know, obviously a difficult job. The whole thing centered around one character who used to be a superpower being but lost his powers due to a uh, an active power siphon. Not mechanical, biological, obviously. Uh, it, it was well acted and everything. It was well written. Wasn't the grace of budget. I mean, I don't think it could have been considering it was just a PlayStation Network show. Yeah. So that meant it was only up to whatever Sony Pictures was willing to put into it. Uh, regarding Star Trek Discovery, the new TV show upcoming, or internet show technically, we still don't have a title to the pilot, but the director of the pilot of the show has been named. David Semmel is doing it. Uh, David Semmel is a prolific TV director. He's been known for doing the pilot episode of Heroes, as well as work on The, uh, the Man in the High Castle, Person of Interest, and a lot of other shows. 
Mm. I remember when Heroes came out, man. That made a hell of a splash in its day. Mm-hmm. So hopefully he can rediscover that kind of magic with Discovery. Speaking of Star Trek, when it comes to Star Trek Beyond, did you guys know that one actor almost didn't return for this movie? And please don't give me about this. Please don't give me any Anton Yelchin jokes. That would just be depressing right now. Yeah, uh, no, I, don't, don't I had do not that. heard that. Uh, who do you think might not have returned? Uh, Carl, Carl Urban. Yeah, he almost didn't come back because he said to uh, Star Trek dot com quote I certainly was hesitant about reprising the role of McCoy. I felt that I was in agreement with a vast number of fans and audience members and critics who, after watching Into Darkness, felt that the character had become marginalized, and I was not keen to repeat that experience. Then he had a uh, conversation with Justin Lin, the uh, man hired to direct Star Trek Beyond. He said, quote, I was immediately intrigued and also somewhat reassured that he was a long-term fan of Star Trek, that he understood the weight and value of the character and how the character interacts with Spock and Kirk. I feel that the version of McCoy in Star Trek Beyond is the most well-defined version of the character that I've had the benefit to play. So, it all turned out for the best, unquote. Hmm. Now, here he is getting ready to hunt a dragon and Pete's dragon, and we found out he's going to wield an axe in Thor Ragnarok. This man is busy. (laughs) And, supposedly, there's a chance, a chance that his version of Dread may be reprised for some kind of internet show. That'd be cool. That could be interesting. You know, they they would have to rehire the lady that played uh, Anderson in that show, man. She she pulled the whole thing together for me. He was good, but she really helped. And uh, another bit of Star Trek news. I might have to go to Entertainment Earth and spend $15. Oh. oh. Yeah, they came out with something that they really should have had at Comic-Con. These things would have flown out of their booth if they did. 15 bucks, you get two coasters. Of? Um, it's not exactly what they were designed for in the show. Their two coasters made in the design of Star Trek The Next Generation isolinear chips. <laughs> oh, interesting. You know, isolinear chips in Star Trek are kind of like the futuristic version of thumb drives. They're just small optical storage devices. But uh, I don't know who designed this, but whoever came up with the idea for these is coasters. Frickin' brilliant. And at a price point of 15 bucks, not bad, a little pricey. But take a look. This is what you would get for $15. A pair of coasters, complete with that bizarre print they had on the, those pieces of plastic they used way, way throughout the show in the 90s. Yeah. Huh. It's, ch- it's nothing fancy, but it's charming. If you put that on a table with an under light, man, you will freak people the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they do glow in the dark, too. Yes. Yeah, the white print on them does glow in the dark. Uh, Willem Dafoe picked up a role I did not expect he'd ever have an opportunity to play. What's that? According to, according to Mashable, Dafoe's going to play Ryuk the Shinigami. Dafoe's been cast in the English adaptation of Death Note. And the character he's playing is that de- demon thing? Uh, one of the homunculi in the series, yes. I think you could pull it off. Well, it, it's all voice work. It's going to be a CG character. It's not like his face is going to be anywhere in it. Oh. But uh, it's it was originally supposed to be a uh, a Warner Brothers adaptation, but the show's been picked up by Netflix. Oh, geez, that means I could see it. <laughs> I, I just put that together. You know, you, you know me and when it comes to uh, adaptation properties. When it comes to anime stuff, I'm hopeful but skeptical. Hmm. You know, there's so many of these things that on paper would make really good shows and movies, but, you know, Hollywood just doesn't generally understand the balance needed between trying to appropriate it and then trying to culturally adapt it. You know what I mean? It's like Edge of Tomorrow was about the only time they got that right. They used a lot of the proper names and everything from the anime, but, uh, you know, they, they struck a good balance between the cultural properties and just trying to make it work for an American audience. Or I guess technically a worldwide audience now. Mm. Speaking of which, another adaptation has been greenlit from anime. Skydance Television is working on a live-action TV series for Sword Art Online. Aww. The script is going to be written by Leda Calogritis, whose work includes Tomb Raider and Nightwatch. 
Uh, she's been inspired by the TV show for years. She said, quote, For years I've been inspired by the inventive and masterful storytelling of the SAO franchise. I'm thrilled to get the opportunity to work with such talented partners to bring this cutting-edge yet timeless story to a new format at Skydance, unquote. Um, as you can imagine, there's a bunch of people online who immediately started moaning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am a fan of the show, and I... I I do think if there is going to be an English adaptation of some sort of it, this is probably one of the best ways to go. There is no way you could shoehorn a movie out of that series. Yeah, no. Even even if you told the just base story of the first arc of the series, there's still too much. You would it would have to be at least two movies to tell that story, man. There is just way too much going on in there. Mm-hmm. Both both action driven and emotionally driven. <laughs> Um, I don't know. What do you think of the prospect of an SAO TV show? I'll give it a shot. Why not? Mm. I've always been skeptical of any adaptation from from animation to live action. I've been burned too many times. Well, you gotta tr- you gotta keep trying those. So there are I know, some I, d- I, I keep, keep trying. There. That's why I've been burned so many times. Yeah, but you you keep talking like you're just going to shut yourself down. You shut yourself you shut yourself down to things, and then you're going to miss out on some really entertaining stuff. Because trust me, I've been working through a lot of swill when it comes to comic books to get this far. And uh, Skydance Media, they actually have some stuff that's not bad to their name. Skydance Media has been responsible for Jack Reacher, Star Trek Beyond, uh, Terminator Genesis, Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation. Uh, Terminator Revolution. You know, they've actually done some... St- oh, World War Z they've done as well. Mm. G.I. Joe Retaliation, uh, Mission Impossible Ghost <coughs> Protocol. They did the uh, True Grit remake with uh, Jeff Bridges and Matt Damon. They actually have some good stuff to their name. Not all of it's good. I mean, you know, there's two recent Terminator movies in there, and I don't really want to get into that. <laughs> But, you know, there's more stuff recently that they've done right than I'd say they've done wrong. Let me put it that way. More than willing to give that a shot. Yeah. Uh, Last up in general media news, we have to talk about a band that broke up recently. And the reason why I bring this up is because this band was created during the time we've done this show. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of the members of the band has left, and that leaves them with just two members left to recreate their band as the idol formerly known as Lady Baby. Oh. Uh, for people that don't remember, Lady Baby was kind of a unique J-Rock metal fusion band that was two idols around a center person that was known as Lady Beard. He's a, he's a European professional wrestler, uh, professional cosplayer, and cross-dresser. He, he just he likes women's clothes. That's his thing, and whatever, because his music really wasn't that bad. Mm. You know, it was interesting listening to the thrash metal come out of his mouth while he's flanked by these two girls. Now it's just the two girls that are left, and they've reformed the band as the idol formerly known as Lady Baby. They'll be having their first concert at the Ebisu Liquid Room in Tokyo on September 17th, and. <sighs> Remembering the music that they did put out so far, I wouldn't say that their singing was really a strong point in the band, as I recall it. Mm. It's going to be another, you know, idol-esque, probably J-pop. It, well, I mean, even in the music they did with Ladybeard, they weren't exactly prominent. It was like they were a pair of backup singers to them a lot of the time. Yeah, they did do... A lot of the, um, they did the refrain, they did the chorus, stuff like that. Well, no, they did a lot uh, of the uh, the main stuff too, and he a lot of the time ended up being a refrain, at least in the first video that I watched of him. What they did in the first video was more it was more like rap, really. It was more spoken word stuff, not as much mm. singing. Um, you know, when it comes to metal singing, I'd say. Uh, that baby metal is probably more about actual singing and music. True. So, I, I, I don't think I'm going to follow that band much longer. <laughs> Actually, I can guarantee that's probably the last I'm going to talk about them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And now we have Marvel comic news. We'll talk about the Marvel properties that are ending up on the comic book page. And just in time for Doctor Strange, turns out Marvel is going to put out on October 26th, Doctor Strange Mystic Apprentice number one. They're taking the uh, story of Doctor Strange, his origin story, and retelling it for a modern audience. Hmm. It's going to be done by Will Corona and Andrea DeVito. The, uh, the press release says, A master of delicate surgery, Dr. Stephen Strange had no equal until a freak accident shattered his hands. Now a student of the mystic arts, Strange must find a way to master his magical assignment or throw in his cape and robes for good. Don't miss this all-new story as Strange finds that the road to Sorcerer Supreme can also be a real pain in the astral form. Also reprinting the original first appearance and origin stories of Dr. Strange from Strange Tales 110 and 115. So, um, the only question I've left to ask is, are they retelling his comic book origin, or are they retelling his movie origin? Maybe it's an amalgamation? Eh, it could be. Yeah. I mean, goodness knows, Doctor Strange, if this movie works, is going to be more prominent than he's ever been. So he's going to need his origin updated pretty soon. Yeah. You know, because, um, unfortunately, a lot of comic book origins don't survive well when it comes to big screen stuff. Goodness knows the Hulk, and I just stood too close to a nuclear explosion, and now I can rage monster. Yeah, that's how it always works out. You know, Spider-Man, I got bit by a radioactive bug, and now I can climb walls instead of going to the hospital for this bizarre rash. <laughs> uh, Star-Lord is getting a new look for the comic books. Uh, this is coming out in the new Star-Lord number one that's being done by Chris Anka, who is the current artist on the Captain America... Uh, not Captain America, Captain Marvel book. Sorry. Uh, he's redesigned Star-Lord, and he's found an interesting way to fuse about three different looks from the past uh, versions of Star-Lord. Hmm. Take, take a look at this. I found this via io9, who apparently got it, got it via comicbook.com. Um, the reason why I say it fuses several different looks, you see that on the far right, him without that jacket with a harness? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was actually very reminiscent of the look he originally had before he was given a bunch of cyborg parts in the comic books. Uh, then there's the fact that he's a blonde. He wasn't that until the movies. He was a brunette until then. <laughs> and the mask is obviously a movie thing. Mm. The, uh, the jacket, though, is reminiscent of his 2008 look when uh, Guardians of the Galaxy was revived as a series post-Annihilation. Okay. Is that when they had the matching uniforms? Yes. Oh, okay. That's when Rocket and Groot were both wearing jackets for inexplicable reasons. You know, I, I'm I'm just so glad they never tried to put one on Drax. No matter what look Drax has, it's always, at least since his latest rebirth, it's always been just a pair of pants. You know, uh, he used to look like he used to look like a pro wrestler in the '80s. It was very bizarre. I would just hate to see whoever has to be Drax's tailor. That man <laughs> must not be able to walk straight. And uh, last up in Marvel Comics news, I have a list from Newsarama. Uh, George Marston put this together. Because the Avengers are coming back into KOTOR with a lot of their premier characters starting to cycle back into the films, he put together a list of what he calls Earth's Mightiest Creators, ten creators who had the biggest impact on the Avengers. Hmm. Each of you want to take a stab at that before, before I go from ten to one? I couldn't even tell should, you who was should be was fairly easy. Avengers. Oh, writing or... Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Writing. Uh, any not, any not uh, writing or no? Oh no, writing or art. Oh. Oh. They've got a little bit of both in here. Either of you want to take a shot before I just get to work? Yo, I would assume Captain America would be a little bit obvious. No, writing or art, not characters. Oh, oh, oh no. Then I have no <laughs> clue. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? You don't think Stanley's on that list? Oh, probably, but. Stanley came in a number. Uh, Stanley came in a three-way tie at number four. Really? Yes. Hmm. I have another guess, but I think you're allowed one guess per person here. You are allowed one guess per person because I don't want to spend the next half hour with you throwing darts at a board. Steve, Honestly, anything? we talked about it earlier with that statue. Huh? Oh, Kirby. Yeah. Uh, Jack Kirby was part of the three-way tie. Ah. That kind of figures. Uh, number 10 is a man named Bob Harris. 
Quote, the 90s was a rough time for the Avengers, with most of the team's biggest names giving way to B-listers and also ran into some strange story choices. Teen Tony Stark, anyone? It's easy to see why the leather jacket era of the team isn't particularly well regarded. And through much of it, writer Bob Harris was spearheading the oddball take on Earth's Mightiest Heroes. While he wrote a few clunkers, he also redefined the Avengers as a team entity, unifying them as a concept and often pushing the envelope when his choices didn't pan out. And without Harris's guidance, Heroes Were Born might never have happened. And without that, some of the greatest Avengers stories of all time might never have come about, unquote. I, I remember the 90s was not good for the Avengers. Uh, the cover I'm staring at, the team he had to deal with was the White Vision, the Black Knight, Crystal, Hercules, Circe, and the Black Widow. That was his team. Wow. Uh, item number nine on this list surprised me because it's a prominent DC name right now, and I didn't know he ever worked on the Avengers. Quote, Jeff Johns took over as writer of Avengers in the wake of Kurt Busiek's milestone stint on the title. And though he had big shoes to fill, he moved quickly to do so. Over the course of three arcs and his only major Marvel work, John cemented his reputation as a creator who truly understood his heroes, both DC's top characters and Marvel's. The pinnacle of John's run was his middle arc, Red Zone, which an in-disguised Red Skull unleashed a plague on the United States. That forced John's Avengers team, which included such unlikely heroes as Ant-Man, at the time mostly obscure, and Jack of Hearts to band together in new ways and establish the Falcon as the heart of John's team. Red Zone had the added legacy of bringing artist Oliver Copiel to the Marvel Universe, a penciler who quickly became one of Marvel's top names and remains an in-demand artist to this day, unquote. Hmm. I'm learning something here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, artist, item number eight on this list of uh, the, the ten uh, creators who, or the ten greatest Avengers creators of all time, is a well-known artist and uh, one that I was aware worked on the Avengers, but I didn't know exactly when. Quote, John Byrne's Avengers resume isn't as extensive as some of the creators on this list. He's far more known for his work on the X-Men and the Fantastic Four. But it's hard to discount the impact he had, even on his brief stints into the Avengers. Byrne's primary contributions came in the form of his run on West Coast Avengers, in which he explored the true nature of the Vision and Scarlet Witch's relationship, telling the tragic story of their Ursat's children, who later became focused players in Young Avengers, unquote. Mm. And to focus on that relationship. Dude. Yeah. You've got to have a twisted mind. Somebody, yeah, somebody got a pretty twisted job there. Yeah. Uh, number seven on this list. I'm aware of his name, but I've never really known what he did in Marvel before. I guess I'm about to find out. Jim Shooter. He's number seven. Jim Shooter's Avengers legacy may be tainted by questionable choices when it comes to the characters of Hank Pym and Carol Danvers, but is equally remembered for the masterful Korvac saga, a story which he co-wrote with Dave Michelin in an in which an all-powerful cosmic villain nearly dismantled the Avengers and their allies, the Guardians of the Galaxy. Over the course of ten years, Shooter penned the Avengers' adventures off and on into his stint as editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics, a position from which he spearheaded the first Secret Wars crossover, unquote. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Busy man. Uh, number six is not a name I know. Ro Roger Stern? Quote, Roger Stern's Avengers, for many fans, the heir apparent to Roy Thomas' early squad of heavy hitters paired with B-listers and Dark Horse choices. It was Stern that brought in characters such as Tigra, Namor, and She-Hulk, who split the team into two branches with the West Coast Avengers. While Stern isn't brought up much these days, he's remained one of the stewards of Avengers history for years, collaborating with Kurt Busiek on the Time Cross miniseries Avengers Forever, and delving into their secret history with Avengers number one half. As one of Marvel's primary architects for decades, Stern carried on a long tradition of top creators using the Avengers to steer the Marvel Universe, unquote. Hmm. Interesting. Kind of unfortunate that he... It sounds like he had a pretty, you know, background but important role. And Apparently just kind of... he co-created the Hobgoblin. That I do remember. That's maybe why I knew Stern's name, at least, because of his work on the Spider-Man book at the time. Hmm. Uh, creator number five on this list is a name I do remember, but only because I've had to fish his name to uh, get signed on a couple books. Steve Englehart. Quote, though he's often overlooked today, Steve Englehart was one of Marvel's top writers in the 70s. 
Aside from a groundbreaking run on Captain America that established characters and themes for Cap that are still being explored today, Englehart took Roy Thomas's Cosmic Avengers stories to the next level, bringing in Mantis and the Celestial Madonna, and then diving deep into the familial relationships uh, at the heart of the Avengers, building on Thomas's established core of Scarlet Witch, Vision, Hank Pym, and their web of interconnected stories. Englehart wrote nearly 50 issues of the Avengers, and like the rest of his work, his stories are often overlooked. However, many of his ongoing ideas from the core of Marvel's current cosmic output, heavily influencing everything up to and including the next Guardians of the Galaxy film, unquote. Mm. I think that we're referring to uh, one of the primary antagonists of the next Guardians of the Galaxy, Aisha. I believe she was created during his run. Huh. Creators number four, three-way tie between Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and a man named Don Heck. Quote, the Avengers' origin story is well known. When Loki threatens Earth, his brother Thor and some of Earth's greatest heroes in history come together as Earth's mightiest heroes to confront a threat no single hero could withstand. But the actual origin is less well known. Allegedly, and we say allegedly because just about anything Silver Age Marvel that revolves around Stan Lee can be taken with a grain of salt, Stan Lee decided to assemble the Avengers of some of his existing heroes when it became clear that one of Marvel's other titles wouldn't be ready for the printer on time. Lee enlisted Jack Kirby, with whom he had co-created most of the Avengers characters, on art. Kirby stuck with the title longer than many of his Marvel creations, penciling the first eight issues before allowing underrated Iron Man artist Don Heck to take over. Kirby returned to plot layouts under Heck's finishes for another four issues later in the run. Aside from creating the team, Lee and Kirby defined what their adventures would be like, creating an always fluid roster of heroes that were just as strong on their own as they were together. And though Heck came later... His work on early Avengers issues, in which he and Lee created many villains and characters, is still, still seen today, can't be denied, unquote. Hmm. Yeah, actually, going back to Englehart, he actually mm-hmm. co-created uh, Star-Lord. Yep. So. Yeah, you, you should read some of the early Star-Lord stuff, man. It, oh my god, that's a very different character. Even all the way through Annihilation. Something about a movie coming out really changed the outlook of that character. Yeah. <laughs> uh, creator number three on this list is one I'm almost... I, I'm actually shocked neither of you named. Quote, Brian Michael Bendis took over the Avengers franchise in the early thousands, rattling the series to its core with the story Avengers Disassembled, which killed oh. off nearly half a dozen longtime Avengers, including Hawkeye, Vision, Ant-Man, and essentially turned the Scarlet Witch into a villain. But what Bendis broke, he put back together, writing the landmark New Avengers series, which brought Spider-Man, Luke Cage, Wolverine, and Spider-Woman onto the team and set the pace for the Marvel Universe for nearly a decade. With hundreds of issues and numerous volumes and spin-offs under his belt, Bendis is actually the reigning champion in terms of the length of his Avengers run. Though his non-traditional take on the team rankled some, it's impossible to deny the impact he had on the legacy of the Avengers." Unquote. It's true. Without his writing, man, the Avengers comics would not be what they are. Yeah. You know, goodness knows, they, the Avengers played second fiddle to the X-Men for, what, two decades? Like all of the 80s and the 90s, basically. Yeah. Well, especially since the 90s, they had that horrible TV show. team. <laughs> no, it's a horrible <laughs> team. It's like, yeah. oh my god. The leather jacket era he's referring to. Uh, creators number two on the list of the greatest creators in the Avengers is another tie. It's a two-way tie between Kurt Busiek and George Perez. Quote, in terms of classic Avengers runs, it's hard to top writer Kurt Busiek and George Perez's long stay on the title. Launching in the wake of Heroes Reborn, which took the Avengers to an alternate world with a very different history, Busiek and Perez's Avengers started by bringing in every character who had ever served on the team and boiled them down to one of the greatest Avengers lineups of all time. Though Perez left before Busiek, their combined accomplishments were immeasurable. As a team, they saved the Avengers from the ill-received Heroes Reborn, and from a prior decade that had taken the team to some strange places. Together, Busiek and Perez redefined the Avengers as a team at the forefront of the Marvel Universe, and a must-read title for years after their run, unquote. Hmm. I've not read this run. I was still having trouble with the Avengers during this time. Uh, what Newsarama and George Marston considers the greatest Avengers creator of all time is a name I'm not familiar with and after I read the article I started to understand why it's a name I should have been familiar with. Do you guys know who Roy Thomas is? No. Okay, stay with this because about halfway through this article you'll understand why his name is important. 
Quote, Roy Thomas took the Avengers range from Stan Lee himself, carrying on his legacy as Stan's heir apparent and the go-to guy for Marvel's second wave. Thomas quickly took the Avengers out of New York, bringing in characters like the Vision and Black Panther and establishing the core team dynamics that still resonate to this day. Thomas's Avengers are what many consider the team's platonic ideal, working primarily alongside the equally legendary artist John Buscema with some help from ringers such as Neil Adams. Thomas wrote more landmark issues of the Avengers than almost anyone. The crown jewel of his run is undoubtedly the Kree Skrull War, one of the greatest Avengers stories of all time and the team's first real cosmic adventure. Thomas was the second writer of the team and the second Avengers writer to be Marvel editor in chief, an honor shared by many Avengers writers over the years. Unquote. You know, I've never read the Kree Skrull War, but I will not deny what effect that had on the Avengers trajectory. Man, mm-hmm. you know, that was a major story, and given that. A lot of editors in chief in Marvel seem to come out of the Avengers uh, runs. It wouldn't surprise me if at one point we read about Brian and Michael Bendis becoming the, the editor in chief of Marvel. <laughs> Apparently, he created the Vision. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me in the least. I mean, uh, was it Ultron's resurgence was big during that particular run. Now we'll move into DC comic news. We'll talk about the uh, the major competitor and the major comic books that are about to come out underneath their flagship, and. Uh, DC is gearing up for the Suicide Squad to do better than I guess they hoped it would by saying that the Suicide Squad comic will be a core part of DCU's Rebirth era. Okay. Uh, writer is Rob Williams. The artist is Philip Tan. It'll have a couple of variant covers by Jim Lee. Uh, it's, supposed to, it's supposed to introduce readers to the core concept of the team before it launches with a formal new number one in August featuring Jim Lee as the lead artist. Uh, Williams won, won critical acclaim recently with his uh, his humor-infused approach to the Martian Manhunter. And he wants to bring the Suicide Squad back to his John Ostrander-era roots, while also making the missions of the squad more important in the larger DCU. They had a cameo of him in the movie. So Who, Easter Ostrander? Egg. Yeah, Easter Egg, actually. Of John Ostrander or Martian Manhunter? John Ostrander, yeah. What was he, a street name, city name? Name of a building. Oh. Uh, something that gets knocked down, I guess? No, it didn't get knocked down. Okay. That means Superman wasn't in the movie. <laughs> um, a notorious writer is returning to DC Comics. His name is Christopher Priest. Um, Christopher Priest is known to some circles as the first major black writer in comic books, mm. to which Priest does not really like that title. He'd just rather be known as a great writer. He doesn't really like the title of great black writer. Yeah. Yeah, I can uh, Chris- Christopher Priest has had a, has had a uh, career in comic books for four decades, wow. and he's written a very well-herited run of the Black Panther. It's considered by some people to be the greatest run of the Black Panther ever. Uh, he's worked on Batman, Superman, and other icons, and he's decided to take on the uh, the writing role for Deathstroke in the Rebirth era. Hmm. When somebody asked him why he chose Deathstroke, his answer was, because he ain't black. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost annoying that the man has such a good reputation, but you know he has to actually divest himself from the idea that he only does black stuff. Yeah. You know, for crying out loud. And uh, another DC creator nearly said no to a project. His name is Gene Yang. Do you remember that name? No. No. Gene Luen Yang is the guy who's currently writing New Superman. Oh. Oh. The Chinese Superman? Okay. Apparently, when DC first brought the project to him and asked him to write it, he told them, quote, there's no way I want to do that, unquote. Uh, reason he didn't he didn't want to get stuck writing this particular story because well, <laughs> he felt it would have a negative negative impact on Superman it would have a negative impact on what according to io9 they asked him you've been writing Superman for a while now going back to the main book was the creation of Keenan Kong always a goal you were working on quote no it wasn't my idea to create a Chinese Superman it was actually Jim Lee's idea When they first pitched it to me, I was like, no, I do not want to touch that. There's no way I want to do that. 
because Superman is like truth, justice, and the American way, right? And with modern China, with the nuances of modern Chinese politics and modern Chinese culture, it felt like there was a bunch of landmines, unquote. Okay, yeah, yeah. That, that totally makes sense. So then io9 followed up with a good question and just asked him, so what made you decide to go ahead and tap dance through the landmines? Quote, I flew down to Burbank and had a meeting with Jim Lee and another meeting with Jeff Johns, and the character started forming in my head. He started talking to me, and I felt like, I've got to do this. Unquote. So something about the pitch Jim Lee... Yeah, yeah, something about the pitch that Jim Lee and Jeff Johns gave him made him more enamored with the character than just the idea of Chinese Superman. Because that sounds so awesome when we say it every time. Well, the thing is, you know, I the only reason I say it like that is because if I say the name Kenan Kong, there's very few people, I think, even in comic books, who are going to understand that. True. And I, I don't think the idea in itself is terrible. However, the idea that the three of the main characters that have shown up so far is, you know, this Chinese Superman, Batman of China, and Wonder Woman of China. I think it's a little bit demeaning for these characters not to have their own names of some sort. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, I'm, I have not read the books. I don't know if they're good, necessarily. I've read some of the critical reviews, but we all know how that goes when it comes to, you know, other people's opinions. Right. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I haven't read it is because I am... I, I convinced myself that I don't want to put the time in it, not because I think it sucks, but because I'm pretty well convinced that people are just not going to buy it, so I, I haven't convinced myself it's worth the time to get into it. I have a feeling about the time I have enough free time to actually read the book is when I'm going to read It's Cancelled. Yeah. Not trying to be a jerk, I just don't think people are buying the book. I don't know. Could be something to look into. Eventually. You know, I, I, like I said, I'll try anything once just to make sure... Uh, just to make sure I'm not missing out on something. I just, I'm just not convinced it's going to be around longer than 12 issues. That's my personal take. Last bit of DC comic news is something that's going to make Alan Moore throw something. Okay. Remind yourselves, what makes Alan Moore angry with DC Comics? Is Watchmen characters? Yes. Yeah, Steve, do you remember this story? Yeah, yeah, the fact that he... Yeah, okay. Okay, okay, I was hoping you would explain it. For those who don't know, Alan Moore signed a contract when he did The Watchmen for Vertigo, which is a DC offshoot company. Uh, The contract basically stated that DC would own the characters uh, for a period of two years after the time that uh, the Watchmen characters stopped being in print. So he would get the characters back and he could do what he wants with them. However, DC has managed to block him from use of the characters because Watchmen has never gone out of print. DC has continuously printed special editions, graphic novels, and all this stuff from the creation of the Watchmen in the 80s all the way through to today, where the Watchmen now apparently are characters who are going to have some kind of, or at the very least Dr. Manhattan, I should say, seems to have some kind of uh, subversive role in DC Comics. They've been brought into the DC Universe, which means it's possible Alan Moore may never get these characters back. Right. Now, adding insult to injury, this week DC announced a new legendary edition of the Watchmen books. <laughs> oh, God. They've taken each of the 12 individual issues, put them in hardcovers, and put them within a set for people to buy again. Now, the reason why I think this is really going to piss off Alan Moore is because you can buy the Watchmen graphic novel off Amazon for about 30 bucks. All 12 issues, one big book, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So why, why in the serious hell would DC take all 12 issues, put each individual issue in its own hardcover, put them in a slipcase, and then sell them to people as a new special box set at 125 bucks? Wow. Movie, new covers. I don't know. You know, even there was an Absolute Edition not too long ago that had some uh, extra material, and it was going for 50 bucks. The paperback collection is going for $12. Why would you want to pay $125 for another edition of The Watchmen? Or, I'm sorry, The Watchmen Collector's Edition box set. <laughs> Man, Alan Moore's got to be just throwing things at a snake god statue right now. <laughs> 
We have uh, general comic and convention news. That's where we talk about comics that aren't Marvel and DC related, as well as conventions all around the world. I don't have any convention news right now. Uh, Post-Comic-Con, a lot of things tend to go on the decline as far as general news. I'm not even getting any news right now about New York Comic-Con, which should, if I remember correctly, be coming up late next month. You would think that there's more news coming out. Either people are just gearing up for it, or there's just nothing new to say about it. Um... There, actually, there is one item that I picked up when I was going through social media. Anime Los Angeles is having a problem right now. Oh, what is it? What's happening? Well, it's not something they created. The Housing Bureau has been uh, getting requests for hotel rooms, and then they've been sending out emails telling people that rooms that they've been approved for are now being canceled. The Housing Bureau apparently miscounted the number of hotel rooms they had available within the housing block. Huh. Uh, Anime Los Angeles has been working on the problem, trying to get them, uh, trying to get the people who have been suddenly, you know, denied in the block alternative housing. Although I don't know what that means. Maybe they'll end up at that place where Jared was with the barely functional lights and oh, you know, the God, shuttle no. ride. You know, it makes me real glad that we booked our own stuff for this. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <sighs> Uh, one half of the creators of The Walking Dead, Robert Kirkman, has teamed up with Mark Silvestri to revive a title that they did back in 2010. Hmm. Uh, they did a one-shot called Demonic. It was about a man who made a deal with a devil, not the devil, a devil, and he made the deal for his own second life, but she has him going out killing people for her. It's been revived and remamped. Dem- de- Revived and revamped. Demonic is coming back August 17th. It's a new six-issue limited series with Christopher Sabella, Nico Walter, and Dan Brown. Uh, it's going to take inspiration from the original. The new series concerns an NYPD detective who shares his body with a murder-loving demon after making a deal to protect his family. Hmm. That's a freaky idea. I'm not sure it's something I'd read personally, but i got to give him points on originality. Yeah. Um, Valiant is having a return of one of its titles. They used to have a a team-based psionic book called Harbinger. They're reviving it. They're calling it Harbinger Renegades, and they're putting it back together with four of their modern characters. Faith, Peter, Torque, and Chris. They're going to have to join forces to quell an impending discontent. Uh, Not a lot has been said beyond that about the story, but it will be an all-new series by Rafer Roberts and Derek Robertson picking up the journey of what's called Valiant's premier psychic super team. Hmm. Man, Faith has turned a real big deal in comics. That's not a weight joke. She's the first, like, plus-size superhero I know of that's actually hit a major when it comes to comic book fans. Hmm. And when I say, uh, when I say plus-size superhero that made it major, I'm not talking about Big Bertha from the Great Lakes Avengers, because she's never hit a major. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is interesting. Um, Mark Brooks, he's been working on the Han Solo miniseries lately. Okay. And I don't know if you guys realize, but when creators do comic books, yes, the, uh, the comic company owns the books that they're selling, but the artists tend to retain the pages they've drawn, which they sometimes sell later at higher prices just because it's extremely original artwork, and there you have the oversized comic pages for whatever you want to do with them. Frame them put them away so nobody will ever get to them, put them in a vault so you can sell them later. I don't know. I I am not in that market personally. But Mark Brooks recently said on Facebook that uh, he was kind of surprised because he had finished issues one and two of Han Solo for uh, for Marvel, Mm -hmm. and somebody contacted him to buy every page he did of those two books. Wow. Super fan. No, not really. Because he revealed that the guy who contacted him to buy those pages was George Lucas. Oh. <laughs> he put out on his Facebook uh, this past Tuesday, quote, got an email last night from Lucasfilm saying that George Lucas would like to purchase every original page from Han Solo number one and number two. Surreal is an understatement, unquote. <laughs> uh, Mark Brooks worked on the entire interiors of the books are written by Marjorie Liu. Uh, the two books are already out, so if you want to take a look at what George Lucas now owns, go check it out. And uh, last up in general comic news, something I didn't realize while we were at Comic-Con. 
J. Michael Straczynski announced that he is leaving comic books entirely. J. Michael Straczynski has written for Marvel, he's written for DC, he did a creator-owned series for Image that's still well-known called The Rising Stars. And, uh, you know, he, he put out a very, very long letter as to why he's doing that. Do you want the cliff notes, or do you want me to read some of this? Um, I don't know how long would either be. If I had to read this out, this might be ten solid minutes. Okay, let's go with the notes. notes. Okay. Uh, two items happened. One, he was going legally blind for a while. Oh, shit. Oh. Uh, he had uh, Fuchs in his eyes. Do you know what Fuchs is? Mm-mm. No. Okay, basically it is a, it's something that, if it's not diagnosed, uh, fluid can build up in the eye, causing pressure and causing blisters that repeatedly rupture on the interior of the eye, which scar and tear the cornea. Gotcha. Uh, the, scar, the scar tissue is known as stroma, and it turns the surface of the eye from soft and clear to a material that feels closer to leather. Jeez. And it, it had gotten so bad that he actually had uh, he had told someone, Marvel's editor-in-chief at the time, while he was working on The Amazing Spider-Man, that he had to slow down because he, he said, quote, I'm kind of sort of losing my vision, unquote. Which is something he didn't want to say because he didn't want to scare people away from hiring him. Right. He showed an example of the size print that he had to read at the time to make sure he, that he was reading his own scripts. And this looks like it has to be at least like 48-point print on a monitor. If you don't know what that is, plug it into your Microsoft Word or your typing program. It's extremely no, it's large huge. text. It's huge. And uh, he begged Quesada not to, uh, not to ever talk about it because, again, he wanted future jobs. He said that he talked to him about this in 2005 or 2006. The two of them grew apart due to creative issues. And as far as Straczynski knows, Casada has never talked about this to anybody. Good on him. But uh, the other reason why he's leaving comics... He, well, I should preface this by saying he eventually uh, had Fuchs tamped down and he got uh, corneal surgery, which he had been avoiding for a very long time because you know if it goes wrong, you lose even more of your vision. Right. Fortunately, in the case of Mr. Straczynski, it went well. He can see again. So he's doing all right. But the main reason why he's leaving comics is because the man has a history of going into an industry, getting as, uh, getting as good as he can get, and then moving on to something else. Give an example. Straczynski wrote the real Ghostbusters. Hmm. He's worked on He-Man, She-Ra, Jason the Wheeled Warriors, and his run culminated in the real Ghostbusters. And then after he got an Emmy nomination, he figured he was right there in the zone, and he had a familiar voice whisper in his ear, you're done here, move on, do something else. Then from there, he went to live-action television. He wrote on Captain Power, The Twilight Zone, Murder, She Wrote, Babylon 5, Crusade, and Jeremiah. After he was satisfied with that, he moved on to comic books. He's been in comic books for a very long time, won some original awards, his vision is corrected, and now he's got that itch again. He's moving on, he's going to start writing novels. Hmm. All right. So that's why Straczynski's leaving comic books. He's not saying F you to the fans or I've had enough of you. He just wants to do something else. All right. So he's going to write novels and see if he can sell them to publishers. Yeah, I wish him well. I mean... That. Oh, I'm, I'm going to miss him, man. He wrote some incredible stuff. He's the one who did the other storyline for Spider-Man. When Spider-Man's web shooters went organic and he developed some extra powers, if you recall. Mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. they undid that story as part of uh, One More Day. Yeah. God. Yeah. I'm sure he was a happy man when he read everything he worked for was just suddenly taken out. And last up, we have our WTF Corner. Those are the stories from across the internet that makes just about anybody stand up, throw their arms to the sky, and say, what in the blue fart is happening on my planet? And uh, video game videos are not out this week. I couldn't find enough clips, so we're just going to get into strange stories. Okay. Australia has a Jedi problem. (laughs) Jedi problem. I I almost don't have to go any further than that. You guys are already getting the point of the story, I imagine. But they do have a legitimate Jedi problem. See, so many Australians are claiming Jedi is a religion on the census that is becoming a problem. Why would this be a problem? Uh, uh, Well, I I assume it, you know, if it gains enough ground, it would become an official religion. That's not the problem. The problem, according to some parties... um, 
probably more non-religious parties, is that the more people mark Jedi on the census who may be either doing it as a joke or they don't subscribe to a particular religion, the problem, as they put it, is that the more people who just generally mark themselves as religious within the country means the country is going to facilitate more dollars and time to religious causes within the country. See, when Australia decides how much, uh, how much faith-based initiatives it's going to have, it doesn't really worry about the, uh, the, the number of religions so much as the number of religious people in the country. Okay. So there's worry that di- data on religious affiliation is going to be used for public policy, city planning, community support facilities, and more things of that nature. Damn it, guys, we actually have to go out and build a freaking X-Wing now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you want to continue to call yourself a Jedi, you're going to have to build yourself a temple, find yourself a Chiron crystal, and build some tech. I, I, I mean, I'm not sure I classify it as much of a problem, but I get why some people are concerned, you know? Yeah. It, it's just one of those things where people are going to have to act a little more sensibly, and I'm, I, I guess I can agree with the initiative that, um, what do you call it? Putting a joke onto a government census page is not the best place for a joke. Yeah. Right, but is it necessarily a joke? Or do they actually have a lot of people that are actually professing faith in the Jedi, you know... I don't know, I still don't want to call it a religion, but anyway. There's only one way to find out. We go to Australia, rent a warehouse, and put a large neon sign on it that says Sith Temple. Let's see who shows up. (laughs) <laughs> we will find out how many Jedis there are in this country very quickly. Uh, there's a Canadian man who had to apologize to uh, to America. Okay. His really? name is John. Mar- yeah, his name is John Marillo. He's a 47 year old Canadian man, and he apologized on the 23rd of July for drinking eight beers and then swimming across the Detroit River. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to assume what? that one of these things had to do with the other. Yeah. Jesse, were you asking why? No, I don't think I was. Actually, why is very important, and why is the reason this man is apologizing. He drank eight beers and swam across the Detroit River to America to prove to his friends that he could. Okay. He told the Windsor Star, quote, If I'm going to be in the paper, I'd at least like them to say I actually made it, even though I got in trouble and everything. I gotta pay fines and stuff, but I don't want it to sound like I didn't make it, because then my buddies are gonna say, ha ha, you didn't make it, because that was the whole thing, to show them I could do it, unquote. That seems like a very American thing to do. Yeah, after that, he, uh, he drank a Molson and slapped a moose. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, no, but because he jumped in the river and his friends were actually worried that he couldn't do it, uh, there was a joint search mission launched between the Canadian and U.S. Coast Guards when his neighbor called the police after losing sight of him in the water. The rescue efforts oh. included three boats and a chopper. Wow. Get this, though. <laughs> Murillo calls himself a strong swimmer, and he must be, because he made it across the river and was on his way back when the U.S. Coast Guard found him floating on the Canadian side at 1 a.m. <laughs> wow. This was two hours after he first got in the river. This man is good. He's good. He burned off all that booze. (laughs) Uh, Windsor authorities have banned Murillo from all waterfront city property. Oh, that sucks. (laughs) And they're fining him $5,000 for swimming in a shipping channel. (laughs) On top of this, he was also ultimately charged with intoxication in public. And, according to him... His mom is mad at him. I think that's probably the most dangerous thing on that list. Yeah, he said, quote, she just hung up on me. She said, you're just so stupid, unquote. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, 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 I want to make another pun, but that man's already in his own little hell for doing something that's actually pretty impressive for a regular person to do. Yeah. You know, you know what really <laughs> kind of sucks, too, is like, you know, he gets derided, you know, all this other stuff, and yet that guy that rode his bike from Canada to San Diego for the Comic-Con, oh, cricket giving him, like, a standish, standing ovation and stuff. <laughs> it's like, damn. Yeah, this guy deserves something, but uh, I, I guess he probably got clashed from the Coast Guard. Oh, you're still alive? Holy <laughs> cow, we, we bet against you. Congratulations. Let's throw him back. 
speaking of old, speaking of older people doing some really amazing stuff, there's a 42 year old skydiver. He has more than 18,000 jumps in his history, and a week ago he made history. He made absolute history because he made a two minute free fall without a parachute. Okay. He jumped out of a plane without a parachute and lived. And Where he did decided he land? this would be a good idea because. He landed in Simi Valley, California, out at the Big Sky Movie Ranch. The reason why he did this, and the reason why it's amazing, is because he willfully jumped out of a plane, no parachute, and landed in a 100 by 100 foot net. Whoa. Yes, he did plan to to land in the net. Yes, it was put up specifically for him. Uh, After he landed, he was greeted by his wife and his four-year-old son, who I'm sure was very glad they didn't end up in someone's internet highlight reel. And he said, quote, I'm almost levitating. It's incredible. This thing just happened. I can't even get the words out of my mouth, unquote. Dozens of people worked on this. The stunt was broadcast live on the Fox network for the TV special Stride Gum Presents Heaven Sent, unquote. You know, depending on how this stunt worked out, either way, that title is appropriate. Heaven Sent? Because <laughs> either, you know, he's either coming down or he's going back. <laughs> Uh, apparently, ju- uh, this man, Akins, Luke Akins, he revealed that just before climbing into his plane that the Screen Actors Guild had ordered him to wear a parachute to ensure his safety. <laughs> okay. Uh, A- Akins said he considered pulling out at that point because having the parachute canister on his back would make his landing in the net far more dangerous. In other words, he might have to land on his back on this thing. Right. So I guess that means it's it's either all or nothing in the case of that stunt. Uh, Sometimes in the WTF, we have to talk about some stuff that is actually disturbing. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, Oh, dear. On July 28th, there's a young lady named Kaylee Jade Jade Bookie from New Richmond, Wisconsin. God, you you say the word Wisconsin, you almost know something bad happened, you know? Uh, She has been booked by police on attempted first-degree intentional homicide. If she's convicted, she'll do jail for up to 40 years. She's being held without bail in a juvenile custody facility before a preliminary hearing that's scheduled for August 8th. Want to know what she did? What did what? she do? She cut the throat of her brother's girlfriend. Why? Let, let, let me go through what she did here. According to a criminal complaint, Bookie called the St. Croix Sheriff's Department on July 27th, the day before she was arrested, claiming that two men in a green pickup truck attempted to kidnap her while she was out for a bike ride. Then she claims to have told the men that her brother's girlfriend was home alone and they should take her instead. Okay, so the police went to the girlfriend's house to find her bleeding bleeding profusely. The girl that she cut is 15 years old. How old is she? Uh... I'm not 100% on that. I don't have her age in the story. Uh, After police found the girl, they took her to the hospital, and the girl thankfully lived. The victim said that Bookie snuck into her room, woke her, and asked her if she wanted to die or bleed out. What? Yeah. Uh, The 15-year-old opted for the latter, the complaint states. Uh, Bookie described herself to the victim as a crazy psychopath looking for her first kill, then told her to have a nice afterlife, cut her neck, and then left the trailer. She cut her neck with one of t- one of two smashed bowls that she broke on the victim's head. You want to know why she was so mad at this young girl? Why? Bookie admitted that she hated this 15-year-old because she made her brother happier than she was able to and planned the attack for a week and a half. Ah, oh, dear. Someone needs help. This sounds like something straight out of a Yandir manga, dude. Yeah. <laughs> she rode her bike 11 miles to the girlfriend's trailer. Th- there is crazy beyond crazy here, man. Yeah, Yandere is actually a really good description. Yeah. Uh, story on Gizmodo says that la- uh, millennials are even lazier than people assume they are. I'm going to preface this by saying that I don't believe millennials are lazy. I do believe millennials are in a very rough position of being the first generation in America 
in probably the last ten where things are going to end up worse than their than the previous generation. I think they got a lot of crap to deal with. You know, I, I I personally think that they're not lazy. There's just not as many jobs available for them as there should be right now because the, the prior couple generations managed to screw things up pretty heavily. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm sorry, guys. Uh, it, Any time that a particular generation is having problems, you can usually find the cause back a couple generations. Yeah, that's the way yeah, so, it works. So I refuse to call uh, millennials lazy. However, there is apparently one thing that they're not doing as much as the current generation or the prior generation. Mm. That's sex. Really? Yeah, uh, according to a recent study, people born between 1981 and 1997, uh, often Bernie Sanders supporters, oddly enough, aren't having as much sex as their parents. The, the study's authors examined a nationally representative survey of 27,000 American adults and found that Americans between the ages of 20 and 24, 15% of them reported having no sexual partners after the age of 18. Only 6% of Generation X, members, between, uh, members born between the 1960s, reported uh, the same thing. The only other age group that demonstrated higher rates of sexual inactivity, according to the study, was born in the 1920s, the Prohibition era, of all things. Uh, I don't think it's quite reached the level of waifus and everything else, but, yeah. Uh, well, this is, a, this is a study of Americans, though. This is well, no, but that's what I mean. You know, it's not like we're, we're quite at that point you know, that the Japanese have reached, but... No, but it does go against the notion that this is the Tinder generation. This is the age of the easy hookup, you know, because uh, according to the study, the people using Tinder are not the kids, it's the parents. <laughs> Which suddenly makes that whole, the, the whole idea of Tinder very, ew, in my head. <laughs> you know, um, according to the study co-author Ryan Sherman... Quote, this study really contradicts the widespread notion that millennials are the hookup generation, which is popularized by dating apps like Tinder and others, suggesting that they are just looking for quick relationships and frequent casual sex. Our data shows that this doesn't seem to be the case at all, and that millennials are not more pros- promiscuous than their predecessors, unquote. Hmm. You know, I, I, I almost want to say that's a bad thing, but we... You know, our generation in particular talked a lot about potential overpopulation in the U.S. Isn't this a decent thing? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you want to kind of control it a little bit without, you know, going to, like, yeah. China's measures of, you know, one child. But yeah, but I also, I also found it interesting that the study itself said that after age 18, 15% said their sexual activity was zero. Meaning that somewhere in the middle to high school range, you know, average American age for first sexual encounters did occur. But somewhere after high school, it's like a group of them just said, you know what? I got nothing left to prove to anybody. Screw all of you. I'm going home. Yeah. Well, I, either that or it could have just been a really horrible first time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> braces, on the, braces on the dong and stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> um, ow. Ow. Did he caught in the hair? Oh. <laughs> Kicked uh, in the mouth. Images I don't need. Images <laughs> I don't need. Well, that's okay because there's a woman who claims she was sexually assaulted by a toy at a hibachi restaurant. What? Hey? Again, this will require explanation, but I almost feel like stating where this occurred would explain half of it right away. This occurred in Tennessee. Police were called to a hibachi restaurant, a restaurant called Hibachi, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee this week, on a sexual assault complaint where the uh, woman complaining, Isabel Lasseter, told them she'd been squirted in the face with a toy by a chef. And this toy is meant to look like a little boy that pulls his pants down and urinates. The people who run the restaurant admit that the incident occurred and said the toy is meant to be funny. Uh, Lasseter, again, the woman in the complaint, says she isn't laughing because it happened in front of her children. Quote, it peed on me, basically, out of his wee-wee area, unquote. She told police she felt sexually assaulted because the toy had a penis. However, in the police statement, police are refuting that claim. The officer wrote, quote, I observed the toy to have no penis and just a hole for the water to shoot out, unquote. Oh my God, they were detailed. What's your opinion? Is this sexual assault? Hell no. No, but it's <laughs> very inappropriate. 
I, I guess it depends. I mean, if they have a reputation for doing this, it sounds like on a regular basis, how could you not know? Then again, maybe this lady did know, and she's looking for a cheap payout. That or, you know, the, everybody's got their own values. I, I just, I think she's just a little bit repressed. Uh, she said, quote, people are missing the point. This was a sexually oriented toy meant for adults in front of minor children. We're not trying to make money off of this. If the toy was in a bar, it would be a different situation. But this was in a family restaurant with 13 and 14-year-olds at the table. If people think it's so funny, why don't people go buy that toy and squirt a cop in the face with it and see what happens, unquote. Okay, because first of all, that that's called assault. assaulting a police officer. <laughs> that's, that's a very serious charge. That's a felony. And number two, 13 and 14-year-olds at the table? I guarantee they've seen stuff dirtier than that. I, I just... Yeah, she's a little bit repressed, and I'm saying this is a, sarcastically. Yeah, this is a big overreaction. She says she doesn't want money. It's funny that she had to add that. I think she's she's really looking for money. Yeah. We'll go from heavy sexual repression to a, li- a very light sexual repression of a physical nature. Japan. Mm-hmm. Japan has come out with a new swimsuit. And, and you guys oh. know that Japan comes out with some interesting stuff based on... Um, Fetishes, sometimes. You know, the, their, their yeah. last major swimsuit was the maid swimsuit. Big buzz in Japan. But now they've come out with something that could be considered... Actually, in my opinion, it is. It's even more risque, but it is technically legal. The bondage bikini. I don't... No. 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 Shut up and wait and experience something, for Christ's sakes. Um, the bondage bikini is inspired by the uh, the rope play that's notorious in Japan. Uh-huh. You know, and they came up with a uh, bikini that seems to be a combination of, uh, looks like nylon and spandex to increase its durability and its elasticity. And I got to say, just from a standpoint of looking at it, it's an interesting design. I'm not saying I would buy this for my daughter, but if you're a full-blown adult and you feel comfortable in this, this, I've seen less on a beach, frankly. I sent you guys a link so you could take a look. There's a couple pictures to look through there. Wow. It's daring. I'm not saying daring. it's not daring. But, yeah, I, I've seen less material on women at beaches before. The bottoms it, are it very interesting with the double straps. The, the, the top seems like it would be very complicated to get on. I don't, I, I don't know about that. I don't know how comfortable this would be. Which I, suppose, I, I can't you know, say for sure. And saying bondage... It, but, well, yeah. the other thing is you got to remember that they did some shots, obviously, to entice people, and women in these shots in Japan tend to wear bathing suits that are about one to two t- sizes too small in general, you know, to make it look even more form-fitting and hugging and stuff. So I don't know how this would fit on a person it's actually sized for. But, yeah, I, I maintain I've seen worse. No, this is true. I, I have seen worse, but... They, they kind of qualify to be their own fetish, so... Hmm. It's interesting, man. Somebody had to put a lot of work into this, into this design. Yeah. So, I give them credit. It's interesting. Um, not long after it was released, it was completely sold out on the uh, Japanese site Baima. I took a look at the English variation. This swimsuit is going for $112. Seems like a bit much for what it is, but you know I can't say because that's definitely a non-traditional design. That may have required a lot of specialized stitch work. Mm-hmm. Uh, io9 and Cheryl Eddy put together a list of the 12 most ridiculous episodes from the 70s Wonder Woman TV show. I have not watched any of the show, but I've read a few of these, and these sound bizarre. You want to know some of this? Okay. Shoot. Uh, ep- Number 12 on this list is the episode Beauty on Parade. Quote, the first season of the Wonder Woman TV series actually took place during World War II, where Diana had adventures like going undercover as Diana Paradise in the, in the Miss G.I. Dream Girl of 1942 beauty pageant to expose this dapper musical director who's secretly a sleazy war saboteur. That was all one sentence. Wow. This requires her to wear a disguise on top of her disguise, deal with meat... Mean Girl fellow competitors show off her dance moves, heavy on the jazz hands, and endure an onslaught of aw shuck sexism from Steve Trevor, who doesn't think Frumpy Diana is pretty enough to pass as a contestant. Later, he asks Wonder Woman if she's a good cook. 
Spoiler alert, Wonder Woman stops the evil plot, and she wins the pageant, even though she's technically not even entered, while everyone idly wonders where Diana is. Season 1 was mostly about Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor fighting the Nazis, and this episode, which features Dick Van Patten as the overly flirty pageant host, is about as kooky as it gets. And yep, that includes the episode that pits Wonder Woman against a Nazi-trained gorilla named Gargantua, played by, hard work- played by a hard-working actor in a fake-looking gor- gorilla suit. That is indeed ridiculous, but it's small potatoes compared to what the show had in store in seasons 2 and 3, unquote. Wow. Number 11, Pied Piper. Quote, when Wonder Woman returned to TV for the show's second season, she had a new network, CBS instead of ABC, and she had progressed to the present day, also known as the late 1970s, a time of spectacularly campy music and fashion. Here, Martin Mull plays Hamlin Rule, a jumpsuited pop star with plenty of groupies, including a core group of leotard-clad beauties he's mind-controlled, using his magical flute and a strobe light, Natch into robbing his own box office halls as a fuck you to the promoters who take huge cuts of his profits. His latest discovery is the rebellious daughter of Diana's co-worker Joe, a Hamlin Rule devotee played by Eve Jan Brady Plum. <laughs> Wonder Woman foil, foils Hamlin's evil scheme, but even she can't save you from getting his terrible flute jam stuck in your head. <laughs> For the record, Pied Piper was season two's sixth episode, and happily, the show would only get weirder from this point forward, unquote. That sounds impossible. Damn. Number 10, Seance of Terror. <laughs> oh, my God. Quote, this episode makes zero sense. The short version is that it's about a psychic and telekinetic kid played by Mike Bobby Brady Lo- Lookinland. Did they plumb every Brady for this show? I don't know. Whose Polaroid photos can capture spirits, a talent which is exploited by his cruel aunt and uncle. See, they run cons on world leaders to keep border wars going in countries that are willing to pay for them to do this service, and the spooky pictures somehow help them do this, as do rigged seances. Meanwhile, the kid is somehow actually legit. Seance of Terror also has perhaps the most dramatic variation on the Diana Gets Knocked Out plot device. This episode also lets the viewers know in no uncertain terms that while Steve Trevor and company may never realize it, both Ira, the computer that helps Diana with her cases, and Rover, the agency's robot dog who serves... Some purpose, I guess. No Wonder Woman's true identity, unquote. This sounds like <laughs> really bad episodes of Doctor Who. Oh, man. Oh. Number, number nine, Diana's Disappearing Act. Quote, this episode has it all. Magicians who are also evil alchemists. A Nobel-winning scientist. A rooftop chase. A billion-dollar con scheme involving the ruler of a fictional oil-rich company. And Ed Bagley Jr. as a nerdy Diana admirer whose eager attentions border on stalking. Oh, and there's also a kidnapping masterminded by mimes. Mimes, unquote. (laughs) Dude. Wow. Item number eight. Item number eight is Skateboard Wiz. Quote, in which the new adventures of Wonder Woman discovers a totally groovy world of skateboarding and has Diana travel to sunny California to visit her teenage goddaughter, Jamie. Too bad her vacation plans of hanging on the beach and watching Jamie slay the local skate competition don't go as planned, thanks to the local sleaze merchant and his secret gambling empire. When the girl is inevitably <laughs> inevitably kidnapped, Wonder Woman fires up a new mode of transport in pursuit. Spoiler, Wonder- <laughs> nope. Spoiler, Wonder Woman saves the day and everyone goes out for pizza after. Did you know Diana Prince loves anchovies? Unquote. There's a couple of gifts they added in the story of her skateboarding. Dear God. <laughs> Complete with a helmet with a W on it. No, that's not a W. That's a bird. That's a golden bird. Okay. I, episode number seven, The Deadly Toys. Quote, in this Christmas-themed episode, Frank Gorshin, best known as the Riddler on Batman 66, plays an eccentric toy maker who creates suspiciously human-like androids for, of course, sinister purposes. One of his giant dolls is an exact copy of Wonder Woman, which, gives Diana, which sure gives Diana a start when she comes face-to-face with her secret superhero self. Obviously, the two Wonder Woman have to fight, surrounded by chattering, clanking, creepy wind-up monkey toys. And the real version beats the robot, though neither the toy maker nor his greedy accomplice realize the truth until it's too late, unquote. But the idea of that fight happening by those damn symbol monkeys. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, that's a little bit... Uh, that's a, oh, that's jarring. That's an, that's an image I don't need. Yeah. So you were like me when you saw Toy Story 3 and saw that monkey behind the controls. You're just like, kill it, kill it with fire. 
Uh, episode number six. My teenage idol is missing. It sounds like there's some kid missing his penis somewhere. <laughs> Quote, real-life teen dream Leif Garrett plays Lane Kincaid, a fictional teen dream who gets kidnapped in the most Wonder Woman way possible by a gang of chloroform-wielding dudes in ski masks. <laughs> I hope he can stay with very well after that. <laughs> a groupie happens to see the grab, but she doesn't see the second part of the plan. The teen dream's long-lost twin brother is brought out of wherever to take his place, including behind the microphone at a huge concert where he's an unexpected sensation. Fortunately, Wonder Woman makes sure both twins survive for their awesome joint performance in matching spandex pants. And for no other reason than it looks freaking cool, she rides in to save the day on the Wonder motorbike, wearing the Wonder cat suit. Unquote. Wow. <laughs> There's so many logic bombs here. Episode number, uh, number five, Pato Gold. Quote, a gang of thugs targets an Irish cobbler hoping to steal his secret gold stash so they can buy plates for printing counterfeit money. Plates that are smuggled into the country via a tack dog and a cobbler, incidentally, who may be an actual leprechaun. But the rascally old man doesn't want Wonder Woman's help recovering me gold, since legend says he has to do it all by himself. Considering the bizarre elements this plot entails, this episode is actually mostly just scenes of guys in sport coats screeching around in vans and getting into fist fights. <laughs> Sounds pretty Irish to me. Still, Wonder Woman, whose very existence, Ira the computer points out, is just as mind-blowing as the idea of a real-life leprechaun repairing shoes in D.C., manages to lasso down a helicopter. Which is, apparently, a really good way to earn a leprechaun's respect. Just FYI, unquote. <laughs> Okay, this one sounds like a G.I. Joe episode. Number four, The Deadly Dolphin. Oh, wow. Shipwreck. Quote, a... <laughs> Lieutenant Dolphin. Quote, a dolphin napping kicks off this wacky episode, which also sees Wonder Woman don her Wonder wetsuit and battle a pack of eager sharks. A purloined... The purloined dolphin is part of an elaborate scheme in true Wonder Woman tradition. This one involves military secrets, a greed-driven land scheme, and a big-ass oil spill. Unfortunately, even though the dolphin is rescued from the bad guys in the open sea, it goes right back into the water park to do backflips for tourists at the end of the episode, unquote. <laughs> it's happier here. So it's just like real life. Episode number three, Amazon Hot Wax. Again, I have images that that wow. title is bringing up that I'm sure didn't come up in the episode. Mm. Wow. Okay. That lube? Actually, I was thinking of... Um, uh, Steve Carell from the 40-Year-Old Virgin. Oh. Quote, Diana goes undercover as aspiring singer Kathy Meadows to investigate an extortion plot against the record label that quickly signs her. There are shenanigans galore, including a novelty trio, one of whom is played by Rick Springfield, that wears white face makeup and rolls in a groovy van. A rocker who faked his own death to increase the value of his music, and a carpenters-like duo, one of whom is played by Judge Reinhold, that's secretly evil beneath their wholesome exterior. There's also the poignant, ironic moment when Kathy has to tell the record exec that he's fallen for her, and that she's not who she says she is. She's uh, government agent Diana Prince, and then she sings, healing his broken heart. Aww, unquote. <laughs> that last part. Oh, oh I, so. I didn't add it. That was their writing, man. That's all of them. Wow. Episode number two. I can't believe we got this far. These are just weird, man. Galt's brain. Quote, Wonder Woman comes up against her oddest adversary yet, a, billion, a billionaire's disembodied brain. It has one googly eye, it's telekinetic, and it has a terrible scheme. It's plotting to get itself transplanted into the strapping young body of an unsuspecting Olympic hopeful. And though it has no mouth, it's capable of taunts. I am invincible! Mwah ha 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 ha! Not so fast, disembodied billionaire brain. You clearly haven't met Wonder Woman yet. Unquote. Wow. Man, Robocop, do, Robocop 2 did that so much better. <laughs> and the last one, number one on this list of IO9 and uh, Cheryl Eddy's list of the 12 most ridiculous episodes from the 70s Wonder Woman TV show... The name of this episode is Disco Devil. Oh, dear. Quote, the most unlikely threat to national security comes in the form of a leisure suit wearing, disco dancing, mind reader who leeches classified info from the brains of government employees in a mirrored room in the back of a club presided over by Wolfman Jack. 
Fortunately, Diana tracks down another psychic who happens to be just as powerful as the Disco Devil, except not evil, so he's willing to side with the good guys. Wonder Woman encount- encountered a lot of psychics over three seasons, but this storyline, which ends with the two men losing their powers as a result of a telepathic mind meld, is one of the strangest by far. Its dance club setting only makes everything more surreal, though our hero does get the chance to teach fr- a frisky dance floor lurker the meaning of beat it creep along the way, unquote. <sighs> Dude, I almost have to watch this show now just so I can lampoon it later. I, nope. Uh, pass. I will pass. Well, I do have another WTF here. It's a video WTF from John Rezus. He decided to apply the theme of the 70s Wonder Woman TV show to part of the trailer from the Wonder Woman movie. Okay. Okay. Intrigued? Yes, uh, a bit. A little bit frightened, but yeah, yeah, we'll go with this. All right. I sent the video. I don't know. I find it kind of appropriate. I'm trying to imagine the generation that found this entertaining. The odd part is, though, it works kind of well. Yeah, it does. (laughs) If it wasn't for the fact that's a period piece, I'd say put it in the movie. And last up in WTF is a tradition of ours. We go to a, a Tumblr site called outofcontextdnd.tumblr.com. Uh, they do out-of-context D&D quotes. It's just simple quotes, and when you read them without the, the context of where they came from, pretty hilarious. Um, we actually had a pretty quick show, so what do you think? 10 or 20? 20. Yeah, let's go 20. Yeah. Okay, so 20. All right. Quote number one is apparently from a very fed-up GM. <sighs> Roll for Gadar. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the second quote, I turned an undead Richard Gere. Wow. Do you think he died by the number of hamsters? <laughs> uh, the third quote here, all it says is, is it came from a monk. And only a monk would have uh, this kind of reaction to something other than possibly a sorcerer. It's kind of cute once you get over the tentacles. <laughs> or maybe a, Jap- maybe a Japanese schoolgirl would say that. How about your, mm. how about your uh, tentacle summoner, Steve? Yeah. You only had one, though. Oh, the next one, though, sounds like it came out of a Disney movie. There aren't any notes in my bag? <gasps> the rats mugged us! <laughs> I think that might be a bard. <laughs> um, I don't quite know who said the next one. There's no, uh, there's no notes as to where this came from. All it says is, we're going to sell all of our starting gear and get him as many donkeys as possible. Wow. I uh, just hope he doesn't own any elves to go with the donkeys. If he does, I'm out. I'm done. Um... I don't quite understand the next one, although I have a feeling it's maybe a bit beyond my generation. The Grick Bro rolled an I-8 to teach you all the Alpha Grick Double Dab Dodge. The hell? What? <laughs> don't even know. I, 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 I don't have a clue. I know what a Double Dab is. I have a feeling I know where this is going, but I don't know what a Grick Bro is. I have no clue what any of that means. Okay. The next one, though, was two players talking together. One had, an, one had a weird idea. The other one expanded on it. You've been reincarnated into corn. <gasps> reincarnated! Uh, uh, boo! Bad uh, pun. <laughs> Bad pun. Uh, I'm going to guess somebody was mesmerized in the middle of a battle. This was a dungeon master who said this. It would be his turn now, but he's busy doing the worm and non-combative dabs. <laughs> the next one is a two-parter. Um, two people talking. I don't know who the first one is, but the second one was a wizard. Aaron, your tumor has a higher will save than you do. Excuse oh. me! My tumor is named Philip, and you will respect him like every other member of the party. 
<laughs> I think there's an archetype that fits this role. Yes, yes. The uh, uh, It's an alternate on the alchemist. Oh, God. Okay, this next one... This actually required a preface, because I wouldn't have understood it if he didn't add this. The writer of this particular quote said that this was a bandit after a mostly wooden Warforged paladin rolled a natural 1 followed by a natural 20 on his stealth check to sneak up on him. So the bandit okay. turns around as this clunky Warforged paladin apparently failed on the stealth, but was really good at disguise, because he just says, that must be one of those roaming Christmas trees I heard about. <laughs> <laughs> this this next out of context D D quote, this sounds like something I would say in the middle of a game. I don't have profession chef. I have craft macaroni and cheese. <laughs> wow <laughs> That's pretty damn good. That is pretty damn good. A a rogue in a Pathfinder game. I pick up the goblin, hoist him over my head, and scream, Ah! to scare the other goblin away. Okay. <laughs> now I want to know if it worked. Uh, the next quote, They're like mini giants. That's, that's about as good as the miniature giant space hamster? Something like that. Okay, this next one was a tiefling who lost her taste buds after drinking a potion. Okay, so I want you to necromance the rat's tongue under mine like a predator type thing. Uh, I, I can only guess the next quote was a DM talking to a bard. You now have plus one on performance checks with a bongo made from your grandpa's ass. <laughs> And now, this one was somebody who definitely had his character screwed up by his dungeon master. Well, looks like I'm an unreasonably stealthy giant puppy with daggers now. Run that through your head. Go ahead. Wow. The next game had a monk who must have been drunk. The quote is just, bippity boppity booya. Uh-huh. Considering my drunken master never said that, then I, I, you know, don't believe that he was drunk. I think he was just really weird. Okay. The next quote, I'm sure it was a DM who was just tired. Yes, it is a plus one ice cream scoop. <laughs> There's only Actual two quotes. improvised weapon. Hmm. There's only two quotes left, and I'm going to flip the order of these just because one is more insane than the other. The first quote. This isn't a fight. This is gardening. What? Oh, they're fine plants. <laughs> and the last one is another two-parter. It's apparently two people talking to each other. Actually, two people talking over each other. This is insane. It will only work if we die. Correction, it will only work if one of us dies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Someone's evil. Who drew the short straw? That's usually you. Uh, yeah, that's the, true. The, the guy that could not slide downstairs. <laughs> I have for, almost forgotten about that. <laughs> Thank you. The subject of the week is Suicide Squad, issues 20 through 23. Uh, I did a little research before figuring out which arc of the Suicide Squad we would read. This was just prior to Forever Evil. Uh, this run was done by Alice Coat with a couple different artists. The first one that came up with pa was Patrick Zercher. It seemed to involve a period where the Suicide Squad was being reformulated, if, if I understood everything correctly. Uh, they had a new analyst, a couple new members on the team, although one of them only seemed to last an issue. And uh, a mystery that I, I don't know anything about. Uh, the lineup of the team at the beginning was Deadshot, Voltaic, Harley Quinn, the Unknown Soldier... King Shark and an unknown analyst, as well as Cheetah, apparently in a, uh, I guess you could say a probationary status. She just got there, it looks like. Um, what were your initial opinions on this run? Was it sad that I was actually more amused and intrigued by the little uh, news reports at the end of the issues? Really? Because <laughs> most people hated those. 
<laughs> I loved the Comic Con episode. <laughs> that was just too close to home. You know, because well, I, I I admit that this version of the Suicide Squad had me interested in the team. However, it was after Rebirth and some of the worst like redesigned costumes I think they've come out with. Yeah, I didn't really even care about the costumes. For me, um, it was a learning thing. I mean, who knows what you know? The DC movies have decided to put in that you know may or may not be canon. But I did not realize that James Gordon had a son. And I certainly didn't realize that he got made into a serial killer. That was a storyline from Batgirl pre-Burnside days. So, yeah. That was was post-New 52. That was pre-Burnside. It was was kind of a big story because I don't think there was a lot of press about James Gordon Jr. until that story. And the reason why he became big in D.C. during that period was because he tried to kill his family. He also had full knowledge that Barbara was the Batgirl. Hmm. So he was a pretty big deal in DC Comics during her particular run. His addition here was a bit of a surprise, and he, the, Alice Coat did a good job of making him sound truly insane in these issues. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, I, his infatuation with Amanda Waller. I was still having. I know he was in love with her because he decided she was as crazy as he was, and she was his mirror of some sort. I didn't pick up on that personally, but the way he just flew head over heels and just backed her on every play she made. That was one of those cases where it's like you almost want to play along with it just because if you would convince him that this is not the truth, he is going to slash something. Yeah. You know, he was uncomfortably crazy. Um, now, over the first issue, I tried to get to know the characters as well as I could. Harley Quinn seemed like the same kind of Harley Quinn from the, the her original run in the Batman animated show, just more homicidal. Mm-hmm. There really didn't seem to be a whole lot of change in the character. I was kind of surprised at this point. Although I think this is before Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti started working on her and turned her into DC's version of Deadpool. Right. Uh, The Unknown Soldier, an interesting conundrum, although I still can't decide if he was important at all. I don't have many reports of this character playing outside this run. Yeah, I I mean, I'm just sitting there going, okay, he has no face... Uh, well, at least not one he, he would show. I don't know if he has no face. He just he, yeah. he doesn't show his face, like, ever. He, you know, obviously very violent, you know, beats the crap out of Voltaic. Uh, I think he kills him. And, no, he doesn't. Well, he, he beats him into utter submission. And then they try to revive him using that drug. The Samsara serum. Did anybody oh. else find that name a little bit ironic, considering the last time we've heard that name? <laughs> Samsara? I've, no yeah. context of it. Samsara was the name of the sidekick during the Irredeemable arc. Yeah. The one that kept regenerating. Oh. It was that was kind of crazy because he cut his brain. He cut part of his lobes out, yeah. Yeah. I, I found that almost ironic that they used that name in this one for a serum that doesn't work properly. <laughs> <coughs> You know, yeah, they apparently um, used it twice to bring back Deadshot by the time this arc started, and then they tried to use it on Voltaic. And something about Voltaic's electric powers reacted badly with the serum, and he exploded. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, it was exploded might not be the right word, because it wasn't like there was a whole lot of muscle and skin left. He just kind of turned to a blood blister and popped. It was... Yeah, not what I was expecting. Um, if I had to find fault with the first issue, I would say that... If they wanted to reintroduce, reintroduce us to the squad, you know, second-rate psychiatric games would not be the way I would do it. It seemed like Gordon and Waller were doing their best to push the different members of the squad to find out how exactly they were ticking at this point. With the exception of Deadshot, obviously. Yeah, it seemed almost a little pointless. You know, I mean, by I now that... I found it more entertaining than what they did in Suicide Squad, the movie. Well, we've covered that's not difficult in general. Yeah. Um, you know, the uh, I mean, this all culminated with Harley Quinn, who seems like she's actually a little content in her cell in her pink pajama onesie. And just writing in a diary when they decide to send her somebody dressed up as the Joker. From the Laugh Dying cult or whatever, Die Laughing. Yeah, uh, it was a member of the Die Laughing cult who volunteered because apparently he, you know, he he agreed to with Waller to try to kill Quinn but he was secretly a Harley Quinn fanboy who just wanted her to sign his chest. 
And then the soldier comes in and shoots him in the head and then tries to tell her that he saved her. And I'm just like... Well, obviously he wasn't aware that this guy was a fanboy. I, I, you know, he was supposed to come in and rescue her and I guess endear himself to her in the middle of this ploy. Yeah, I just... I was like, man, this is just... Uh, who expects that kind of crap to work? <laughs> I, Warner Brothers. I, I couldn't say. It it might have played out better if uh, if he, if this member of the Die Laughing Gang played a wrong and tried to actually kill her, but it's just not what he wanted to do. I just and, I, I mean uh, my my opinion of Harley Quinn is that she is not stupid enough to fall no. for. So, I mean, the guy walks into her cell. She, yeah, he's obviously there with Waller's, you know, complete, you know, amnesty and everything. So the fact that the soldier comes in and saves her when he's already known to be like her guy <laughs> inside the team, I was like, this isn't going to play out any other way. It, it is a bit of a gaping plot hole. Otherwise, I found it to be a relatively solid issue. It, it builds up the story behind the characters pretty well, with the exception of. Cheetah, really, and Voltaic, who it turns out we don't need to care about anyway. Right. Uh, other than that, I thought the issue in general was pretty solid. And the art the art style that was put up by the uh, the guy working on this particular issue, Patrick Zerker, it, wasn't it, was appro- it was appropriately dark for the tone. The problem was when he encountered more colorful characters like Quinn and uh, you know Deadshot. It seems like that was when his art struggled a little bit because their, their costumes and their look don't really agree with the dark tone he was putting together. Mm. And I don't mean that just conceptually, because obviously Quinn is always going to dress like a clown went crazy one day at a strip club. I just mean that when uh, when he had to draw these brighter colors, it seems like that's where certain flaws in his style kind of came out, you know? That yeah, was my the, problem with it anyway. I don't know, I mean, because that could also be blamed a bit on the inker, too. It could. It was just something that stuck out to me. Every time the panels got bright, I, I noticed issues with it. Uh, every time it was dark, like with King Shark and what he did with that android, that was intimidating. That made me feel very sorry for him. Yeah. You know, I, I think that was the strength of Alice Coates' writing, is that she definitely seemed to be breaking down each member of the squad and tried to make them more than the archetypes most people made them into. Because King Shark in DC history has always been a rar rar bite type of character. He's just been Killer Croc, but less reptilian. And in this case, they tried to make him into something much more than that. Mm. And I got to admit, over the four issues, I started to actually like the character of King Shark because you've got a character that is both embracing and fighting his instincts. He doesn't want to be a mindless monster, but sometimes, you know, just that 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 thing in his brain that tells him to hunt and get blood just keeps coming forward. Yeah. I mean, it just in the first issue, you know, where it's like, is he reading? I didn't know he could. It's like, damn. Yeah, and then he <laughs> orders 12 vegan shakes. <laughs> you know, it seemed like he was just trying so hard to be more than the sum of his parts that everyone assumes he is. Yeah. So, I I, I thought the first issue was a good building block. It was It made me sit up a bit more and pay attention to where this was going. Yeah. I, I, I think... Issue two was a hot mess. Oh I, God, I just, that confused the hell out of me. I, 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 I got to agree that the narrative would have helped more if they just focused on individual stories going forward in a more linear passion. Trying to flash back and forward from the squad fighting uh, some kind of zombie homunculi made up of a number of bodies, and then back uh, flashing back to just after a Harley Quinn and the Unknown Soldier got done with that member of the Laughing Gang and moving forward from there, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, I I didn't get why any of it was important initially. I had to go back and flip through it again to see what was happening. Yeah, all right, now this is making sense. I'm looking back over this. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I flipped back over it. It was better the second run, but that shouldn't be a uh, that shouldn't be a selling point in the comic. It's better the second time through. It should really be good the first time because, as Stan Lee keeps saying, every comic book is someone's first comic book. Yeah. You know, you got to write this, and I'm not. I'm I'm not going to sit down and say Alice Coat did a bad job. I I think she was given some narrative choices, probably by DC editors, to fit in something else that she didn't need to. Or he. I'm sorry, I don't know if Alice Coat is a man or a woman. Because the story of how Harley Quinn broke out after she stabbed the unknown soldier after the fake rescue, and then just went straight for Waller in a practical beeline, 
was impressive as hell. Yeah. It was a Batman-esque, Wolverine-esque feat that she pulled off in short order. With and then she, fr- Yeah, and then she freed Deadshot for the sake of, and instead of cutting Waller to pieces like any other psychopath, it's almost like the analyst in her came out, because she duct-taped Waller to the chair and started asking questions. Yeah. I actually felt that was very in line with, with Harley Quinn. You know, yeah. Just by the fact that she was How do you tick? Yeah. Especially considering that she originally just tried to get inside of her head with a fake Joker. Yeah. <laughs> and we should also preface this by saying that Harley Quinn got out of her cell after stabbing the soldier because someone hacked Bell Rev's system at this time, and she just used the opportunity. Yeah. Um, the scenes in this issue with Deadshot showing off his accuracy, I didn't really need that. Yeah, I think it was it was almost more just, you know, amusement factor, background noise, you know, distraction... Or in also, or meanwhile, stately Wayne Manor type thing. <laughs> yeah. Although I did like his dialogue with the cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, handsome, let me out. Can I trust you, cheetah? Uh, yes, definitely. That's what my first wife said. Goodbye. My first ex-wife. <laughs> no, just his first wife. Oh, first, wife. first wife. Okay. Yeah, uh, issue 21, page 8, uh, last three panels. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, listening to Quinn and Waller go back and forth, y- you definitely knew which one was sane, but which one wasn't, but you, you really had to kind of guess which one was smarter at that moment. Yeah. And I have to say, between the two of them, I like, you know, Harley so much more than I like Amanda Waller. She's well, I a mean, character that I just always hope dies. Even with the mm-hmm. issues I had with the art, I thought Coates' writing was pretty strong. It, Alice Coates seemed to have a real strong idea of each individual character. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that because of the deconstruction they started. I mean that because they actually had individual voices. Uh, this is the type of series where the unknown soldier and Deadshot could have sounded very similar, but right. neither sounded anything like the other. Yeah. And I have you to know, say, still, the, the one that kind of carried the whole thing was, was again, uh, uh, Gordon. Oh, yeah, when he showed up at the end and decided to fight by himself, which is not something you'd expect of a guy who you've assigned to sit in a desk chair. And it's not like he fought both of them actively. He came up and sucker-punched the one that was still standing. But, again, not what you would expect from the geek. Yeah. Then we find out that Waller's been using death row inmates to fly predator drones. That's brilliant in a very sadistic way. Um, so I, I understood in the midst of all this that Gordon shows back up in the control room where Waller's still taped up. Harley Quinn has a knife at her throat. And then Quinn succeeds in negotiating somehow for a different sentence, which is never really defined over these four issues. Um, yeah, no, it is. Uh, well, there's a, there's a time frame given and there's one aspect of it, but I, right. there's never really a behavioral issue that's explained in these four issues. I was trying to figure out what they received in exchange for getting the bombs removed other than the particular time frame, which was shortened from the average Suicide Squad run, if I remember correctly. But what was the negotiation? Yeah, that I don't know, because they never actually showed the conversation with her right. and Waller. And that was one of the issues I had with this run of four issues. Was as, as interesting as I found them, I don't think they ever really picked up from this point after Forever Evil. I think they kind of jumped to a new run of Suicide Squad, another writer, and none of that was ever really well fleshed out, as far as I know. Well, I did find it interesting after issue four of the Suicide Squad, it said that the rest of the story was going to be con- continued in the individual comic books. I was just like, wait, really? Yeah, that, that's a bad decision. You yeah. shouldn't make people chase the story in four different issues when you've already got an established team book. Yeah. I mean, maybe the story continued, maybe they found out what it is, but once you're on the other side of Forever Evil, you've given people, unfortunately, a very good jump-out point so that they, they they can pretty much decide at the beginning of this run whether or not they care. You know? Yeah. I can only guess that maybe she agreed to be the active field leader and do some good behavior in exchange for these leniency. But that's the best guess I got. Yeah. Or, you know, 
I'll work with you. We'll do your dirty jobs. Hell, we kind of enjoy it. So, you know, treat us or nice maybe, and we'll work better with you. Or maybe we'll stop actively fighting and trying to escape and just pull the jobs. Who knows? Yeah. Um, and then it flashes back at the end of the issue to, again, the zombie homunculi apparently pinning down uh, Deadshot, and there's Cheetah with a chain gun. That all would have been... That all was really unnecessary in the issue. The three quarters of it had to do with a flashback to the negotiations and Harley Quinn's escape. The three, four pages they dedicated to the zombie thing did not need to occur in this issue. Yeah. No. Especially because they kind of rehash it in the third. Oh, yeah. They they go through it completely at a completely different angle. I did like the... Uh I don't remember, was it the third issue or the fourth issue, where they started introducing them as, like, what they well, were doing at that time? Yeah, the, yeah. The, the third, third issue had to do with what they were doing in Vegas prior to the zombie thing. James Gordon Jr., is, uh, he's introduced as serial killer, maybe analyst. Deadshot shoots things. Harley Quinn is having a good night out. Yeah. The unknown soldier, party pooper. <laughs> You know, I think they introduced the cheetah as a speciesist. Yeah. A spe- a oh, and then uh, King Shark. <laughs> a speciesist. Yeah, King Shark was introduced as, his name is Trixie, he likes to party. <laughs> because that was his dialogue as he showed up. <laughs> yeah, the third issue was still written by Alice Cote, and the artist is still Patrick Zerker. You know, what really sucks for the third issue is if you manage to completely ignore the flash-forward pages from the prior issue... This, as an individual, like, one-issue uh, one story was actually not that bad. No. Yeah. You know, it was a good introduction to the, the capabilities of the team, their individual modes, how they work together sometimes, and what they're overall capable of. If, if there's any individual weakness, it would have just been the villain, uh, Mother. Yeah. She was I, barely defined by the end of the issue. Yeah. I was just like, okay, so... Really unimportant villain. Check. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, the the plan the plan seemed like something out of the Wonder Woman list, where she took the uh, suicide the people who committed suicide in Vegas and made this ten story tall zombie homunculus. I did like uh, Gordon sitting there going, "Yes, I think he was heading towards the light." You know, da 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 da, and and they're just like, "What, really?" And no, and people wonder why you're crazy. And he's like, "Well, either that, or it could have just been programmed to go hit that thing." <laughs> <laughs> I, I was kind of impressed by uh, how Patrick Zerker made those panels of Deadshot and Harley Quinn checking the hotel and they run across that hedonist uh, Las Vegas party yeah, yeah. They're like, these guys are supposed you know, to be nihilists right yeah a bunch of people half naked a uh, like a circus strongman and a monkey swinging from a hanging lamp then the next time you see him Deadshot's trying to give a report while Harley Quinn has got that chimpanzee by the leg and swinging it at somebody else <laughs> That was one of those things where it's just, that's impressive yet frightening. <laughs> yeah. So later in the issue, the unknown soldier, Deadshot, and Quinn all end up in the same place. And it, see, that would have actually made an interesting movie moment if they added the soldier into the, uh, the DC Cinematic Universe. Because instead of asking questions while firing a submachine gun, he takes a rocket launcher and tosses it to the crazy lady. Yeah. That's one of those things where you can almost hear the heavy metal music as she's lining up the bazooka. Yeah. That would have been fun in the movie. <laughs> you know, they all receive the uh, the orders to erase that thing at a distance. The unknown soldier says, acknowledge. Deadshot says, boring. And Harley Quinn says, I have no idea why I'm doing this. <laughs> you know, and again, everybody uh, underrated King Shark because they assumed he was just trying to bite off the Achilles tendon or something that's already dead, and he's trying to explain with zombie gore in his, in his mouth. <laughs> what I'm trying to take is its foot. Yeah. Not going after the tendon. I'm taking yeah. the entire thing, <laughs> which turned out to be the best part of the plan, frankly. Other than the fact it, that it was going to fall on po- uh, populated buildings, I don't hey, think at least they he, care. He had a working strategy at the time. Yeah, everybody's shooting at it. It wasn't going down. He took the foot, and that thing immediately staggered. You know, at least he's showing some intelligence overall. But the end of the issue is when we find out that the Samsara serum that uh, Deadshot and Waller have had at different times is also killing them. Oh, it, wonderful. It, it eventually kills them. Apparently it has a failure point. Or a half-life, I guess. Hmm. That would have made an interesting twist if they followed through with it. I don't know if they would have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
you know, again, I don't know after Forever Evil and the uh, the multiple refreshings that DC's had after the 52, what they kept and what they didn't. And then uh, issue 23 had a different artist on it, Rick Leonardi. I don't think he was as fun as uh, Zerker. His art style was a little more undefined, I would, I guess is the word I would use. A lot more colorful. A lot more colorful, but nowhere near as detailed. Mm-hmm. And then we find out that the person who's engineered everything since the beginning of this run appears to be uh, Wildstorm mainstay John Lynch. Yeah, that I, I thought that I, name sounds familiar. I'm like, why do they keep using him as a villain? I don't know. John Lynch, uh, Jesse, if you recall, he's the one who was a Team 7 member. He was Gen 12, and he ended up uh, mentoring Gen 13 during the first part of their run. The man with a single cyborg eye. He used to be head of IO, like a Black Ops division. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out how the heck he got a through-and-through through shot through the head from a sniper rifle. And was still completely, completely fine. fine. Yeah, it wasn't a through and through. I think uh, I think it was bad special effects work. I think it was supposed to go behind the head, but whoever was doing it did not. Uh, it, it, or I think it was supposed I to go in front. I think it was supposed to go in front of the face, and whoever did it didn't do a clean job. Okay, because I mean, yeah. it, it looked like the it, only thing that it makes, definitely passed out through his cheek. Yeah, I mean, it looked like it went through his head, but at, at, at other angles, it just looks like it just got grazed. Yeah, in the following panel, it looks like he had a creasing wound. In other words, a bullet like thoroughly grazed that part of his face and took his ear, but didn't go through his head. Yeah, that was a horrible picture in that point, because they literally drew a hole through his cheek. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's not like things like uh, things like that are unheard of. There have been people who have been shot in the side of the head, the bullet skirts the skull under the skin and goes out the other side. Yeah. Although, I, I doubt you want to do anything so unlikely. Graphic. In a comic book, and I use unlikely in the best possible terms in a comic book. <laughs> um, yes, technically, that would have been a miss for Deadshot. <laughs> yeah. I actually did laugh a little bit at this issue, because they basically yeah. used every unused member of Stormwatch Zero. That is true. I was, I was like, man, I, I kind of recognize these guys, but at the same yeah. time... These were the other characters who were part of the Faux Justice League introduced late in the War in Alice Stormwatch run when they introduced Apollo and Midnighter. These were the other members of the team. Oh, okay. The only one missing is Stalker, the allegory for uh, the Martian Manhunter. The half Damonite. Right. Uh, Lamplight, Crow Jane, Amaze, Impetus. Yeah, I knew Every- Crow Jane. Yeah, everybody but Titan, who was new for the books, probably the replacement for uh, uh, Apollo in this story. Everybody was an allegory for the Justice League that was killed on their first mission of Stormwatch. <laughs> so uh, I laughed a little bit that they were back here, but I was kind of disappointed that as soon as they were brought in, three quarters of them were annihilated. Yeah, Actually, it was just kind of a, four, yeah, four our fifth. team is better. Yeah. This was, I got the feeling this last issue, which I understand was the last one Alice Coat wrote. Wherever they moved on to, this was the last issue of Suicide Squad they did. Uh, this is why I don't think there's a lot of story threads to pick up after Forever Evil, because it feels like the, Alice Coat was in a hurry to just finish things up and get the hell out of here. Yeah. And I, uh, again, I'm not saying Alice Coat was fired. I'm not saying they hated the job. But I am getting the idea that they were at least reassigned, and this was the last issue they had to do, and after that it just wasn't their concern. So the writing had to shoehorn itself into Forever Evil, and then after that it was wherever it was going. Right. I did like uh, the weaponized uh, pheromones. I did, you know, mm-hmm. find it amusing that you know he he was apologizing afterwards, and that you know Shark saw it and was kind of trying to get buddy buddy with him. I know, and it's not like Shark was trying to blackmail him. He, I think, he just found that as something they could bond about. You know, the secret they shared. You know, when this is over, Deadshot, I'd love to have some kombucha, some kombucha with you if you're so inclined. Ah, oh, please, Shark, we have nothing in common. Are you smiling uh, at me? Maybe. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was an impressive move that the reason why we hadn't heard from the unso- unknown, shoulder, unknown soldier the entire issue was because he was hiding as a uh, an African general's bodyguard, and as soon as they were in the panic room with him, he kills the other guard and then shoots the general. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I think that's why I like the Unknown Soldier was because he was the perfect weapon for uh, for Amanda Waller in this, and he made a much better guardian than one of the Rick Flags or uh, Jack Flags they've used throughout the series. Mm-hmm. 
you know, he's just this near silent killing machine that everyone has to follow, not because Waller says so, but because he's that goddamn intimidating. <laughs> but I, I still would like to know what deal Quinn worked out because the uh, the members of the squad on this chopper seem pretty content with their roles in this issue. Right. And I mean, they, they mention at this point, you know, yeah, they got the, the bombs in their necks taken out. You know, they yeah, only have to serve a year, and after that, they turn into informants. Uh, informants. I, 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 I'm still surprised anybody went for that deal because even if they behave during that year, as soon as they're gone, what makes you think you're going to hear from any of these people again? Yeah. You know, even if Harley Quinn isn't dealing with the Joker, she has enough international contacts to disappear at least across the U.S. Deadshot definitely has the contacts. King Shark, if he makes it to a body of water, you won't hear from him again. Even if it's a lake, he will sink to the bottom of it and just sit there reading something. Yeah. So I don't understand this deal. And then Jim Gordon reciting song lyrics in his head to Amanda Waller at the end. Dear God. (laughs) He was definitely, I, I don't know if it was just the newness or the uniqueness, but yeah, he was just... He was freaking me out. Yeah. Um, That was the four issues we read, and I, I gotta admit, uh, it's not bad. The only thing that troubles me, though, was I purposefully looked up uh, a run of issues from the Suicide Squad that would be good. I looked for some of their most critically acclaimed recent series. And this was the only one that popped up. Apparently, this was a gem in the middle of a bunch of turds in the middle of the Suicide Squad. Mm. Uh, I, I don't only think lasted four issues. Yeah, I, I don't know where Alice Cote went after this. I'm sure it wouldn't take much research to figure it out, but I was between things. Uh, I did look up the Suicide Squad in its general runs. There has not been a run above 74 issues in its entire history. The current run is up to 38 issues. And apparently the first issues post-rebirth have not been receiving praise. Hmm. So I looked carefully just so I could find something so we didn't have to say, look, another DC book that we're not liking. I I wanted to find something we were likely to go for. Yeah, I mean, Um, overall, my opinion of this is, you know, not bad. It's definitely not something that... I would recommend to anybody, especially now knowing that, you know, (laughs) those four issues, that's it, you know. But uh, I didn't feel like I was wasting my time reading it. You know, it, it, it kept my interest enough. But I did. I was far more amused just with the little two-page things at the end than mm-hmm. you know the actual uh, storyline overall. Well, I mean, excuse me. Sorry. I uh, I did enjoy the read. I was a little disappointed to find out that uh, Alice Coat was gone after this, and Alice Coat has run like written screenplays in addition to comic books. So, has multiple abilities there. I just... I guess I was just disappointed with the idea that, like you, the knowledge that these four issues, that was it. Yeah, because you know, I mean, wanted it seemed like more. they were getting somewhere. And then all of a sudden, yeah. four was just kind of like a, alright, team kicked ass, you know, got the guy, and then I'm sitting there reading at the end of it, going, okay... So now you got to go and read all these individual people's books. Why? Mm-hmm. And I, I was really starting to like the idea of the team. I, I wasn't liking the idea of them as individuals at this point. So I, I didn't see any reason in even checking into that. Yeah. Um. I. I don't know. I, I guess I can say I did like this run, but I, I don't see a reason for me to actually read any other Suicide Squad books with the knowledge that this was it for Coat. Yeah, well, and then also the fact that this was apparently the, you know, part that was well-received and everything else is not so much. This is the best-rated books they've had in the modern era of the Suicide Squad. There may have been better in the prior runs, but I figured those would be a little bit harder for me to procure from uh, from comic book shops. I mean, we're talking Volume 1 from 1987 to 1992. Yeah. Which wasn't exactly the best era for comic books in general. Yeah. You know, Volume 2 was a 12-issue run from 2001 to 2002. Still a rough era for comic books. Volume 3 was the era we pulled this from in 2011 to 2014. <clears throat> so I, I kind of had to pick and choose a little bit, and this was the best I could do that wasn't some kind of weird mini-series that was either titled Raise the Flag or Amanda Waller or The Silver Age Omnibus. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
So I did my best to find something that I was pretty sure wasn't bad. And, uh, I don't know, I, I'm with you. This was a good read. It's just, it's not something I can say, you know, this is where it picks up, or this is where it gets good. All I can say is, this is when it, when it was good, and now I'm pretty much done. Yep. Which is really sad, because I'm like you. The stories they were building for Harley Quinn, and Amanda Waller, and James Gordon Jr., and even King Shark, those were getting good. Uh, the Unknown Soldier, I was starting to really dig him as a character, even though I knew absolutely nothing about him. And it, it felt like there were some mysteries that, or some dynamics that really could have been explored further in that book. Uh, Jesse, what do you have to say? Um, I had issues with the second issue when it did that weird flash forward thing, and it screwed me up for the rest of the run. Now that I actually understand that there was a flash forward point, I... If I reread, I might be able to enjoy it, but I say on my first initial run through, it it bothered the hell out of me. I, I did enjoy the characterization of a lot of the characters that they used. I really mm-hmm. hate Waller. I liked uh, King Shark. I liked Harley mm-hmm. Quinn. I mm-hmm. did like that uh, 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 300 parody uh, Deadshot did right there with Titan. Oh. <laughs> that was a little painful. <laughs> but um, after things. After watching the movie Suicide Squad, this was far more enjoyable. You know, I, I'm going to, again, guess that Editorial told Alice Code that he was either off the book or he was being moved or something, and he had to end things very quickly, because that last issue, when everything was suddenly settled with Lynch, felt way too rushed for somebody of the supposed background of the character and how good he is at setting things up. For him to be annihilated in a mass drone strike felt lazy. Yeah, mass drone strike and stealth bombers and stuff. I was like, holy yeah. crap, this is one freaking guy. Yeah, I and mean, granted, he had a bunch of very powerful super beings with him, but for him to be so blind after setting up the last three issues like it was a human chess game getting ready to play out uh, with his squad versus the Suicide Squad, yeah, I, I can just guess that Coat got the news and he just said, well, i got to finish this up now. Yeah, I mean, they they literally... You know, mentioned his name and killed him in this in the same yeah. issue. After three issues, a pretty strong build up too. I, I was starting to get actually interested in the story of the squad and who was messing with them so thoroughly, and then it just it, it ended in one of the most anticlimactic, like sucker punch ways possible. Yeah. So that was disappointing. Um, if people want to read this run, it's issues twenty through twenty three of volume three. Um, I would say issues 20 through 22, actually, are what you should read. 23 is not quite worth your time. Well, it does give an ending to it. You might as well just do the whole thing. I suppose. But it, I'm like you. I can't give this to people, not because it's violent or dark or anything, but simply because it feels unfinished. Yeah. And it feels like the best the Suicide Squad has to offer was cut short by some kind of outside factor that I, I don't think I'll ever be able to pin down unless we happen to talk to Alice Coat, who I found out is a man in the Czech Republic. Hmm. So odds are, no. Not going to happen, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's about it. Um, I know that the next thing we had in our slate was to read the first volume of uh, Doctor Strange. Right. However, I had a thought over the last week as I was listening to what the conover we did for Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. and the podcast we did at Uh, Comic-Con. I'm not unhappy with either of those, but as I was listening to it, I was thinking, you know what, we should really just sit down and have an evening where we talk about what we did, what we saw, and what we liked. Because it always feels like, while we're at the show, we're always so blasted or in the middle of it, we never get to finish anything. Uh, During the Conover, I know Anthony was asking questions, but he might not have known everything to ask just because we were the ones there. Right. You know, and it feels like there's a lot of details we missed out on simply because nobody knew what to ask us about because of how all-encompassing Comic-Con is, you know? Yeah. So maybe next week, instead of having a reading assignment, we should just sit down, talk about Comic-Con, talk about what we like, talk about what we didn't, and let everybody who listens to this show understand whether it's a worthwhile show. How does that sound? Mm, that, that'll that work. Mm. Uh, are we going to bring Brandon in? Uh, I'll ask him if he has time. You know, it, it wouldn't hurt to get an outside opinion, after all. Yep. Uh, I'd like to get V in, but her schedule is so haphazard, I can never tell if she's able or not. So, yeah, I think next week we'll just have a Comic-Con discussion. Okay. We'll break down the convention as best we can, and we'll probably do it on a day-by-day basis, since the order of events makes it easier to remember what exactly we were doing. Mm-hmm. Sound good? Okay. Sure. 
All right, and I still have volume one of the latest volume of Doctor Strange on the back burner for us for uh, two weeks. Okay. So thank you for tuning in. I invite you to roll with us again next week. It'll be our Comic-Con discussion. Uh, thank you very much. I am Jeremy. Steve. And Jesse. Don't jerk and drive. Take care of yourselves. <laughs>